This is the W5SC repeater, PL110.9.
Afterglow Movie Net, Saturday, 10.30 p.m., W5FC. Chairman, I need to make myself very clear. If we uplink now, Skynet will be in control of your military. But you'll be in control of Skynet, right? Yeah. Ooh, and it is time for Skynet. Does anyone need to use the repeater before we get started? We'll take that as a no. So, let's get started. Skynet is a weekly net called every Saturday night at 9 p.m. concerning the subject of astronomy. Our purpose is to help amateurs become more familiar with the nighttime and daytime sky astronomy and space in general. This net is open to all amateurs interested in this topic, and we encourage your participation, comments, and suggestions for this net. Station with priority or emergency traffic may enter the net at any time by using the pro sign break break in your call sign. Is there any emergency or priority traffic? Please come now. This is a directed net, so please do not transmit without direction from net control. That would be me again. And stations are reminded to IT at the end of your transmissions. This weekly net operates on this frequency with a PL tone of 110.9. Check-ins via Echolink are also possible using the W5FC-R station ID or Echolink node 37247. Tonight's topics, astronomy charts, pictures, and live audio video links are available online. Go to the club website, which is W5FC.org right now for a complete list. And remember to tell others about this popular net. All amateur operators are welcome, and we need not be a member of any amateur radio club to participate. This net is approximately 90 minutes long. We have General Astronomical Society of Dallas 
events where and when you can look through a telescope, National Space Society events. Discussion topic of the evening, selected by the NCS, was uh, space exploration and space history. Constellation of the, the Scarlet's Constellation of the Week, by the way, space launches of the week, recent astronomical discoveries, visible satellite passages over the next couple of days, astronomical Q&A, Q and, a, and the 73 round. We may or may not get to all of those, but we'll see what happens. Okay, all amateurs with licensed transmit on this frequency are invited to check in, and we'll do that right now. I'll take low-power short-time check-ins. If you are one of those folks, please come with your call sign, phonetically your name, location. Let me know if you're short-time or low-power. Windy 5, bacon, lettuce, tomato. Bill, W5BLT, low-power. W5BLT, Bill, he says he's low power, and uh, you are scratchy into the repeater. Anyone else, low power, short time, please come out. Hello, golf, five, uniform, foxtrot, Romeo, short time. Hello, India five, Papa, golf, Mike, short time. UFR, short time, KI5 PGM, I think that's Travis, he's short time. Okay, I've got three of you here. Do any of you three have anything you would like to bring to the net now before you disappear, either because of low power or the fact that you're short time? Please come with your call. Move on to general check-ins. Here we go. Please come with your call sign phonetically, your name, and your location. November 5, Bravo, Bravo. No, in Irving. Got one check in N five BB Bill in Irving. I know there's more people out there. Please come now. We're in general check ins. Please come with your call sign phonetically, your name, where you're transmitting from. Oh, I was too slow. November Tango five, Tango Mike, Tony and Dallas. UO India five, uniform, uniform, Juliet, Dustin and Dallas. My name's not General, but KF5JHA, Chaz, Mesquite. Hello, Foxtrot 5, Zulu, Bravo, Lima, Bill, Farmer's Branch. Bravo Delta, Guy and Forney. This is... Whiskey, Bravo, number four, Mike, Foxtrot, India, W, B, four, M, F, I, Ted, Dallas, low power, long time. Okay, everybody's going to straggle in, so let me get those folks. I got NT5PM, Tony and Dallas, Q5 
KI5 UUJ Dustin in Dallas, KI5 JHH Chaz Mesquite, KI5 ZBL Mr. Bill Farmers Branch, KG5 BZW J near Rutherford, K1 GBD, Guy in Forney, and WB4 MSI. That's Ted in Dallas. He says he's low power, but he's staying for the duration. Additional check ins, please come out. Whiskey 405, Oscar Zulu Lima, Brendan DeSoto. This is Alpha Golf Niner, Sierra Golf, Antonio in Dallas. This is Kilo Golf 5, Whiskey Victor Lima, James and Carrollton. Kilo Golf 5, Uniform Kilo Uniform. Hello, Bravo 9, Sarah Oscar Kilo, Sean in Fort Worth. Hey, got a few half dozen here. I got WB5OZL, that's Brenda in DeSoto, EG9SG, Antonio, Dallas. Next station was James and Carrollton. I got a kilo something five Victor Victor Lima. Uh, James, could you give me your full call? Kilo five Victor Victor Lima, Victor Victor Lima, Carrollton. Kilo five Victor Victor Lima, Victor Victor Lima, Carrollton. Oh, I got you that time, and uh, I messed up both sides, prefix and suffix. KG5 Whiskey Victor Lima, James over in Carrollton. KG5 UKU, that's David in Mesquite. KB9 SOK, Sean in Fort Worth. Additional check-ins, please come out. Kilo 5, Golf Lima Delta, Randy Rowett. up one more. I got Randy, K5 GLD over in Rolette. All right, I'm going to turn my attention to Echolink. If you'd like to join us uh, from over there, uh, please come now with your call sign, your name, and where you're transmitting from. I will give you extra time. Echolink only, please. Kilo Fox 5, November X-Ray Romeo. John Cato Mills. This is Kilo 5, Kilo Tango X ray, Kelly in Quinlan. Actually, three there. I've got K5NXR, that's John and Cato Mills. Welcome, John. K5KTX, Miss Kelly, Mayor of Quinlan. Well, uh, N5IMS, JJ, I always put him in because he's out there always lurking. He's always got jokes over on Echo Link, so I'll put him in. Okay, I'll open it up to anybody who would like to join us this evening. Any mode, please come now with your call sign phonetically, your name, where you're transmitting from. Number five, Oscar Fox to us, Clay in the street. up one more, N5OF, that's Clay and Mesquite, I think most of the usual suspects
So we'll go ahead and this evening. They can be of uh, uh, this evening's event. They can be ham, astronomical, space, or of general interest to licensed hands. November Tango 5, Tango Mike. All right, Tony, NT5TM, I can tell you're in your handy talk. You could make it back to the big radio. Something's going on over there, but uh, please go ahead. Yes, I've been playing with antenna connections, and I was... <laughs> really startled there to discover that, yeah, I had to grab an emergency candy talkie. I'd like to remind everyone that this is not the last net of tonight. Uh, we have the Afterglow movie discussion featuring Invasion USA. Uh, you may have seen Red Dawn. You may have seen The Day After. You may have even seen the obscure TV miniseries America. Uh, tonight, all those things come together with Invasion USA, a movie from the early 50s featuring lots of vintage aircraft. We'll talk about it tonight at about 10.30 p.m. You know, I don't think I'd ever seen a flying boxcar before in a movie. That's, you know, I just kind of turned the sound off and looked for the vintage aircraft. But that's okay. Uh, also, two weeks from today is our lecture and lab. We're going to be building an antenna that will receive aircraft signals quite well and also weather satellite signals from both the U.S. and Russia. Uh, more details are available at w5fc.org. So I hope to hear you tonight on the Afterglow Net. I hope to see you at the lecture and lab because building antennas is fun. I'm even working on a presentation for that. And I hope you enjoy Skynet too, because I will. NT5 PM. All right. Thank you, Tony. And yes, I've seen a flying boxcar actually flying at that when I was like seven, eight, something like that. I even had a telescope that I was, well, yeah, I think it was eight. I had a telescope, I could see it, and the, the rear door open. It was pretty cool, but I'm very old. Okay, uh, let's see here. Anyone else have any announcements? the usual announcements. Don't forget AMSET has actually three nets available to Dallas residents. Tuesday evenings at 8 p.m. You'll need Echolink installed and you registered. You can go into your groups and AMSAT and you'll find an audio or you can find a live audio link from AMSATnet.com. Go there and you can listen in. That's the mother ship. Uh, they have all sorts of information on amateur satellites. However, we are very uh, fortunate to have two nets here in Dallas that you can check in on and actually ask questions and get answers. We've got Dallas AMSAT East, uh, Dallas Fort Worth, every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. on this repeater. Uh, Tom and 5 hyp is the net control, or are welcome to check in, unless it's the first Tuesday of the month, which is the ARC club night, in which case then there's no AMSAT East because Tom is at the meeting. Dallas AMSAT Net West is every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. on the Arlington repeater. That's 147.140 megahertz for the PL110.9. That's Ops questions once again. Never mind. <laughs> I'm reading the wrong thing. We all have here on the DERC repeater bunches of nets. Monday nights of rotating a uh, series of nets. First week's ham fixings. If you love to cook food, this is the net. It's at 7 p.m. Very interesting. We get a lot of uh, check ins on that and tips. Second week is MCOM 101. That's Kevin and 5KRG. He talks about uh, emergency communications. If you're looking to maybe join with an agency or you just want to know more about emergency communications, this is the net. Third week, a second helping of hands fixing, same as the first week. Fourth week is GeekNet. That would be Tony, NT5TM, and he'll take anything and everything having to do with not only amateur radio, but all things geeky, because let's face it, hands are geeky. Then the fifth week is a surprise net. 
uh, when there is one. It's the fifth Monday. If we told you what it is, it wouldn't be a surprise. It's always a game. Something fun on air participation is encouraged. Friday evenings is Cert City right here on this repeater. Learn about emergency radio communications. Cert trained amateur radio operators. Melissa, who did check in here just a few minutes ago, KI5GRH, net control. Visit the most disaster prone city in the universe every Friday. Cert City, all are welcome. Saturday evenings are the night of nets. Of course, we have tech net from 7 to 8, which I included earlier this evening. We have Skynet at 9 o'clock, and then the afterglow movie net, of course. First and third Sundays, Dallas Amateur Radio Club meeting on the air. Learn about everything going on for the DARC. That also is at 7 p.m. And then daily at 6.30 p.m. is the ARRL National Traffic System Training Net. You can learn all about uh, communication, emer uh, communications and how to uh, do it. Sorry, not, I got distracted here. If you want to be, be a part of a formalized net and learn how to do that, that's a perfect place to be. If you're new ham and you're a little scared to get on the air, you can do no wrong on the 630 training net. Come on by and uh, meet some folks. Next up is the Afterglow Movie Net. As you know, I always write a very accurate version of what the movie is about. You've already heard it is Invasion USA. So here we go. Hello, I'm Vince Potter, and here's the news. The bar patrons weren't up to another fake broadcast by Potter, a failed newscaster who was relegated to giving his broadcast in a local New York bar and only to the people inside. He hadn't worked on an over-air show in years. Carla Sanford was assembling a fallout shelter out of slizzle sticks and crammed a couple of cocktail napkins in her ears. The bar was pretty much devoid of energy, especially after Potter started his broadcast lounge act. He began, enemy aircraft are over Seal Point, Alaska, and no paratroops have landed at Alaskan civilian airfields are in the process of taking them over. American B-36 have, retal have retaliated and hit the capital city of the enemy. We'll be back with more America at War right after this message from Geritol, because you're tired. An audible collective groan rose, followed by bar patrons throwing things at Sanford, trying to get him to shut up. Join us for this unknown Cold War classic, Invasion USA 1952. No, it is not the Chuck Norris version. They don't even, it's the same name, but a completely different movie. You'll love it. It's at 10.30 p.m. And if you haven't seen the movie, we'll just talk about Invasion movies anyway, because there's lots of them. You can keep up with all the DARC events, nets, and activities by going to the club website, W5FC. Okay, any additional check-ins, I'll take them now. If you'd like to join us, please come with your call sign name where you're transmitting from. Kilo Zero, Foxtrot, Echo Romeo, Chris, and Southeast Dallas. K0FER, Chris in Southeast Dallas. I have you checked in. Okay, next up is Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas. And that would be, Ch I think, uh, Chad, KS5JHA. You want to go ahead and enlighten us from ke 5 ICA. Thank you, Tom. Yes, I can enlighten everyone. If I turn the lights off, I'd delight you. Uh, the next Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas Club meeting will be held on Friday, August the 26th, 2022. The meeting will be held at 7.30 p.m. in person at the University of Dallas. That's on Campbell Road. And will also be held on Zoom. The featured speaker is going to be none other than Kelly Miller, k 5 k 
and our topic's going to be about the TAS library. Uh, Kelly, would you like to uh, enlighten us about what details you have about that? Sure, Chaz. This is K5KTX. I won't be talking about gravitational waves or anything interesting like dark matter or black holes, but I will be talking about the fantastic library collection that is owned by the Texas Astronomical Society. Currently, we have over 900 books that range from some of the latest titles all the way back to about 1867 is, I think, our our oldest uh, book that we have. We have atlases. We have um, historical books. We have novels um, and just some great materials on how to observe, how to do astrophotography. Um, and so I am, uh, have been spending, I don't know, the last couple of years working on a project to get our entire collection online in an app that's called Tiny Cat. And uh, it will make it much easier for people to see the books and see what's available, uh, uh, see a description about each book, and they can check out the book right from that app. Um, so they'll be able to do that from their phone, from their laptop, um, wherever they're at. And uh, so I'm pretty excited to introduce that. That will be my topic um, at the meeting that's coming up. And uh, that's it. I will send it back to you, Chess. Kelly, and thank you for being the librarian for so many years. Uh, she won't be the librarian soon because the books are going to be moving somewhere else, but we're not quite sure where yet. Well, maybe we do. Okay, uh, let's see now. Uh, in Saturday Sessions have begun tonight so that there'd be an opportunity for live reports from the TAS public observing sessions. Is there anyone at the uh, public observing session for TAS uh, that's a ham radio operator that would like to report from there? Come now with your call sign if you'd like to report. I didn't think I heard anyone check in from there. Okay. Uh, well, they have begun. And if you'd like to get more information about the Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas, their public observing sessions, or their meetings, go to their website, texasastro.org, for up-to-date information and details. And this is KF5JJ sending it back to our net control. I call him Grandpa Skynet, KE5ICX. Oh, thank you, Chess. You're just so complimentary, as always. All right, this is KE5 ICX, Grandpa Skynet. Uh, let's see, next up is National Space Society events, where uh, <laughs> I'm like on autopilot. Bill, N5BB, what do you have for us on National Space Society? KE5 ICX. Good, Tom. Thank you. This is N5BB. I happen to be the membership director of the National Space Society North Texas chapter. And uh, we have a uh, chapter meeting on the second Saturday, excuse me, the second Sunday afternoon of each month. So that means we have a meeting tomorrow. And the meeting will be at the Spring Creek Barbecue at uh, the southwest corner of Beltline and Highway 183 in Irving. Starting at 3.30, we, meet, we start gathering together, and the presentation starts at 4. Visitors are welcome. Our presentation tomorrow is going to be um, Mars Exploration, Past present and future. That will be the presentation by one of our members to the group tomorrow. And there will also be a WebEx virtual version of that. So if you have any interest in the National Space Society, or if you want to see this uh, WebEx presentation, 
live. You can send me an email at n5bb at uh, arrl.net or space at byram.net. That's S-P-A-C-E at B-Y-R-O-M dot N-E-T. Uh, we don't have any, the only activity we have coming up uh, that we know of in the rest of August is an event called Space Day. I, we think that's going to be the name. At the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History for the Museum District in Fort Worth um, uh, a week from today on um, Saturday, uh, August the 20th. I should be there. All I got uh, in 5BB. Does anybody need any fills on anything we've presented this evening as far as announcements and bulletins? Please move your call. Okay, I think I need to use Echo Link. Uh, um, uh, in 5 eb um, as far as paying dues, last time I, I actually tried to go to the um, local chapter of the National Space Society, uh, I could not do anything. Is there a way to pay from the website now? Or uh, is that something that be could be taken care of at the uh, um, the little event tomorrow? Uh, that's uh, all I have a question to ask right now. KG five easy to do. Hey, can I answer him directly, Tom? Go ahead, Bill. Okay, Jay. Uh, yes, if you do come to the meeting tomorrow, just bring some money. Um, and I will send you an email tonight reminding you of the, um, the your membership dues happen to be due right now. I'll remind you of the membership dues. Bring money, mail, or you can uh, it via pay PayPal. PayPal is the easiest way if you have a PayPal account. Again, Jay, look at your email. Um, tonight and I will uh, send that to you and let me just make absolutely sure sorry about these, these folks um, Jay is it your call sign at yahoo.com is that a good email address from you and 5 BB uh, yes uh, kg 5 bzw at yahoo is fine kg 5 bzw Okay, I think I sent the renewal to another email address to yours. Anyway, I'll, I'll copy that to your address here in just a few minutes. I'll be checking your email here, uh, and I'll, uh, I'll send all the details to you. That's all I got. Thanks, guys. Back to you, Tom, in 5BB. Thank you, Jay. Thank you both for that, and let's see now. Next up is the topic of the evening. That's uh, selected by me as net control. That's a sneaky way of getting a feature presentation, too, when other people are net control. But the cool part about it is you get to talk about anything you want. We've been talking about the uh, Webb, uh, James Webb uh, telescope quite a bit, but there are other telescopes, and this one isn't even in space. It's not on the ground, and it's not in space. It's called the SOFIA Flying Observatory, or the uh, Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit this evening. 
So what is it? Well, it's a Boeing 747 SP aircraft modified to carry a 2.7 meter or 106 inch reflecting telescope with an effective diameter of about 100 inches. Flying into the stratosphere at 38,000 to 45,000 feet puts Sophia above 99% of the Earth's infrared blocking atmosphere, allowing astronomers to study the solar system and beyond in ways that were not possible with ground-based telescopes. Sophia is made possible through a partnership between NASA and the German Space Agency, DLR. So a little bit about the telescope. The telescope looks out of a large door in the uh, port side of the fuselage uh, near the airplane's tail and initially carried nine instruments for infrared astronomy at a wavelength of 1 to 655 um, micrometers and a high-speed optical astronomy optical astronomy at uh, wavelengths of 0.3 to 1.1 micrometers. The main instruments are the flight com cam and a near-infrared camera covering 1 to 5 micrometers. Forecast covering the mid-infrared range of 5 to 40 micrometers and the HAWC, which stands the far infrared in a range between 42 and 210 micrometers. The four instruments include an optical top, top photometer and infrared spectrometers with various ranges. Sophia's telescope is by far the largest ever to be placed. One attached to the telescope. Two groups of general purpose instruments are available. In addition, an investigator can also design and build a special purpose instrument. On April 17, 2012, two upgrades to the HAWC were selected by NASA to increase the field of view with new transition edge bolometer uh, detector arrays and add to the capability of measuring the polarization of dust emissions from celestial sources. Now, uh, the open cavity housing the telescope will expose to high-speed turbulent winds. In addition, the vibrations and motions of the aircraft introduce observing difficulties. The telescope is designed to be very lightweight with a high comb shape built into the back of the mirror and polymer co uh, composite material used for telescope uh, assembly mount includes a system of bearings and pressurized oil to isolate the instrument from vibration. Tracking is achieved through a system of gyroscopes, high-speed cameras, and magnetic torque motors to compensate for motion, including vibrations from airflow and spacecraft and I'm sorry, the aircraft engine. The telescope's cabin must be cooled prior to aircraft takeoff to ensure the telescope matches the external temperature prevent thermally induced shape changes. Prior to landing, the compartment is flooded with nitrogen gas to prevent condensation of moisture on the chilled op optics and instruments. The telescope is designed for infrared ast astronomy observations in the stratosphere at altitudes of 41,000 feet. Sophia's flight capability allows it to rise above almost all of the water vapor in the Earth's atmosphere, which blocks some infrared wavelengths from reaching the ground. At the aircraft's cruising altitude, 85% of full infrared range will be available. The aircraft can also travel above almost any point on the Earth's surface, allowing observation from the northern and southern hemispheres. Flights are flown three or four nights a week. The Sophia Observatory is based at NASA's Armstrong Flight Research Center at Palmdale Regional Airport, California, while the Sophia Science Center is based at Ames Research Center in Mountain View, California. 
the observatory's mobility allows researchers to observe from almost anywhere in the world and enable studies of transient events that often take place over oceans where there are no telescopes. For example, astronomers on SOFIA studied eclipse-like events of Pluto, Saturn's moon Titan, and the uh, uh, Kuiper uh, Belt object MU69, the next flyby target for NASA's New Horizons spacecraft to study the object's atmospheres and surroundings. During 10 hours overnight flight, Sophia observes the solar system and beyond at mid and far infrared wavelengths, gathering data to study. So some of the things they do study are star birth and death, formation of new solar systems, identification of complex molecules in space, planets, comets, and asteroids in our solar system, nebulas and galaxies, celestial magnetic fields, black holes at the center of galaxies. These telescope instruments, cameras, spectrometers, and polarometers operate in near, mid, and high infrared wavelengths. Each student is studying particular phenomena. Spectrometers uh, spread light into a component colors in the same in a manner, uh, ooh, let's see here, uh, studying a particular phenomenon, spectrometers spread light into component colors in the same way that a prism spreads physical light into a rainbow to reveal chemical fingerprints of celestial molecules and atoms. Uh, polar meters are sensitive to the effect that magnetic fields have on dust in and around the celestial object, allowing astronomers to learn how magnetic fields affect the birth of stars and other objects. Like space-based telescopes, Sophia lands after each flight, so its instruments can be exchanged, serviced, or upgraded to harness new technologies. Because these new instruments can be tested and adjusted, Sophia can explore new frontiers in the solar system and beyond and serve as a test bed for technology that may one day fly in space. The aircraft is operated and maintained by NASA's Armstrong Flight Center building uh, 703 in Palmdale, California. NASA's Ames Research Center in Silicon Valley manages Sophia's program, science, and mission operations in cooperation with the University Space Research Association and the German Sophia Institute. Unfortunately, I had some bad news. Um, NASA and the German Space Agency at TLR have decided to discontinue flight operations by the Sophia Airborne Infrared Observatory. The basis for this decision was the assessment of national academies in the USA that the scientific output of Sophia no longer justified its operating costs. Ooh. Germany contributes 20% of the Airborne Observatory's operating costs and developed and built its globally unique telescope, which has enabled observations of the night sky from the fuselage of Sophia for eight years. The cessation of Sophia's flight operations is by no means the end of the German-American cooperation, uh, emphasized Thomas Zerbuchen, NASA's Associate Administrator for Science Mission Directorate. In a joint workshop to be held this summer, we want to work with DLR on new projects in future scientific fields. The scientific data acquired by SOFIA are available in NASA's archives to astronomers worldwide. The Boeing 747 SP, which was converted into an observatory for infrared astronomy, completed its five-year prime mission in 2019, and this was extended for another three years until 2022. Now, there, if you're really interested in what the inside of this thing looks like and a nice walk around of the aircraft, uh, 747SP is one of my favorite aircraft. It's an extended range, it's 56 feet shorter than a regular 747. It's kind of stubby looking. Uh, very cool aircraft. They're only under 100 built, if I remember correctly, so they're relatively rare. 
but uh, there is a video available. If you go to the club website, w5fc.org, and look through the notes for this evening, you will find Sophia Walkthrough. And it's a YouTube video of a fellow that went up and looked inside, asked questions. It's an excellent video if you want to find out more about Sophia. So this is KE5ICX from Net Control. That concludes my presentation this evening. Does anyone have any questions? I will try and answer them if you do. Number five, Oscar Fox Trot. Clay, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Tom, a uh, uh, great presentation. Yeah, I was wondering with all these uh, things we got going up in the space, like the uh, the the uh, spacecraft, uh, it uh, just uh, might just went blank, but the one that just went up as far as the observatory up in space and. And we get so many more space observatories. I was wondering if uh, that they are going to uh, one day or pretty soon render the uh, ground observatories, like the McDonald Observatory, if they're going to uh, put them out of business, uh, 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 M5OS. some of that, this, 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 and, and I think there's other folks that can even answer it much better than I, but I'll, I'll just say this. Yes, there can be, uh, that can be a certain uh, possibility, but remember, too, that even Earth-based uh, telescopes, they can change out equipment as necessary. Uh, another thing, too, is they keep building uh, larger and larger telescopes. There's one that's supposed to go in uh, somewhere in Hawaii. And there's another one in South America. And thanks to computers and the ability to, to um, increase the size of mirrors using clusters of mirrors to be able to get even better resolution. And then there are some observatories also using uh, computers are able to change the shape of the mirrors so that they can get even better imaging. So while space-based is always considered the best, uh, some of the ground-based uh, uh, observatories are actually getting smarter, bigger, and better. So they won't go away. Probably the biggest threat we've got is uh, pollution, light pollution, and then uh, low Earth orbit satellites that are marring, observing of, of various uh, of various objects because there's so many low Earth orbit satellites right now, mostly the Internet ones, but they aren't the only ones, and that causes a lot of problems. Uh, does that help answer your question? Uh, yeah, Tom, that's, uh, that, that's good to hear because i uh, got good memories of places like McDonald's Observatory, and I know there's other great observatories out there, so uh, it's good to hear that those... Uh, those babies will continue to go on. Uh, good presentation. Thanks a lot, Tom. M5OS. All right, very good, Clay. Does anybody have anything else they want to add? we got a lot of experts here. Does anybody have anything else they want to add about Clay's question about uh, Earth-based uh, observatories versus space-based and how they can compete with space-based? Please come now with your call. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Bill, and 5 bb This is in 5 bb Well, there's something the Earth, things the Earth-bound telescopes can actually do better. One of them, of course, is if you're looking for uh, incoming objects like uh, meteorites and things, uh, it can be very convenient to do that on the Earth because you can see them coming through the atmosphere from below. But there's other things which are sky surveys that are very wide angle where um, they're looking for events um, in a very, very wide angle. 
and uh, usually that's done on Earth-bound observatories. Most of the space-bound observatories are comparatively, most of them, are you know pretty small, uh, uh, are looking at a small angle because they're looking at distant objects as opposed to uh, things over the whole, uh, the whole sky. And radio observatories work pretty good on the Earth. They can be rather large. Difficult to build uh, currently with current technology to build a big radio observatory in space. So, to my knowledge, all this—I don't know if there's any significant radio observatories in space. Maybe some microwave things, but not the lower frequencies. Those are best done on Earth. And uh, radio observatories are still very important for many observations. In fact, EB. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate your adding in there. Okay, let's see what's next on the list. I can ask if there's any additional check-ins at this point. If you'd like to join us this evening, please come now with your call sign, your name, where you're transmitting from. All the cool kids are here anyway, so let's go ahead and move on to the next section, which is was up, and that would be Chaz, Camp 5 JHA. Chaz, what do you have for us this evening? Um, this is Jazz KF5JHA. Just to piggyback on to the last uh, segment, uh, the telescopes on the surface of the Earth are better in some regards than those in outer space for several different reasons. Uh, one is something called adaptive optics that can compensate for the Earth's uh, atmosphere. And also, if you want to have any upgrades in technology, it can happen really quickly here on the Earth. But if you want some sort of upgrade for a telescope in outer space, that usually takes a while, if it's a possible at all. might not be possible. Anyway, so those are some of the things that are advanced advantageous to telescopes on the Earth. We need to get some on the moon. Atmosphere. Anyway, my degree is in astrophysics, and I work in the astrophysics labs and the geology labs at Dallas College on the Brookhaven campus, and we do call this segment of Skynet was uh, Slide Master, that would be Tom. Slide Master, slide number two. On August the 11th, that's just a couple days ago, the moon was full. The current phase of the moon is a waning gibbous. On August the uh, 10th, the moon was at perigee, which is the point in the moon's orbit that is closest to the Earth at a distance of 359,828 kilometers. On August the 11th, the moon was full. I already told you that. On August the 19th, the moon's phase will be third quarter. On August the 22nd, the moon will be at apogee, which is the point in the moon's orbit that is furthest from the Earth at a distance of 405,418 kilometers. The moon will be new on August the 27th. On September the 3rd, the moon's phase is the first quarter. And on September the 7th, the moon will be again at perigee, which is the point in the moon's orbit that is closest to the Earth at a distance of 364,492 kilometers. Slide master, slide number three, please. meteor shower peaked just a couple of nights ago. This year, the Perseids peaked on the night of August 11th and 12th, which is the usual time. Unfortunately, the full moon on August 11th interfered with the meteor shower peak. Now, you can still see some of these meteors in the sky. This annual meteor shower is one of the major meteor showers of the year. It can be seen mainly from the northern hemisphere, but with most of the Earth's population living in the northern hemisphere, and with this being the warm summertime, for the northern hemisphere, it's become the most famous and the most widely observed meteor shower. Usually the best time to see meteors is after midnight and before morning twilight because this is the side of the Earth that is running into the left over clouds of debris left from comets and asteroids. If the moon wasn't interfering with the meteor shower, you could have seen maybe uh, one meteor every minute during the perceived meteor shower. Years ago, I lived in Seattle 
and I drove up to the Cascade Mountains onto a logging road to watch the Perseid meteor shower. The hour just before dawn, I observed 90 meteors in an hour, which on an average is about a one meteor every 45 seconds. That was an awesome time. I've seen more than that meteor storms time, maybe in November when we have the Leonid meteor shower. Slide master, slide number four, please. In just a few hours from now, on the morning of August the 14th, that's just a few hours from now, the moon and Jupiter will be in conjunction in the early morning eastern, well, actually the southern sky at this point. So you can actually find it probably after midnight easily. So after Skynet, go out there and take a look and see if you, well, after, not just Skynet, but the movie review, you know, we call it the afterglow. And then you can go out and take a look at the moon and Jupiter close together. Slide master, slide number five. The early mornings of August 17th and 18th, Venus and M44, the Beehive Cluster, will be in conjunction. Now, you really need a pair of binoculars to see M44, so get out your binoculars, take a look for the planet Venus. It's a really bright one in the eastern sky on the mornings of the 17th and 18th, and you can see the... Um, it's an open cluster called the Beehive Cluster and Venus next to each other. Slide master, slide number six, please. On August the 19th, in the early morning sky, the moon and the planet Mars and M45, which is the Pleiades star cluster, it's also an open star cluster, um, will be in conjunction. Now, once again, using a pair of binoculars will help in observing this conjunction pretty cool thing to look at. Slide number seven, please. On August the 25th, the moon and Venus will be in conjunction in the early morning eastern sky. And slide master, slide number eight. On August the 28th, the moon and Mercury will be in conjunction in the western evening sky. Yes, Mercury is in the western sky right now. And this is KFI, JHA, and this is Skynet. Slide master, slide number nine, please. And the next Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas Club meeting will be held on Friday, August the 26th at, uh, at uh, 7.30 p.m. at the University of Dallas. And also on Zoom, the feature speaker is going to be Kelly Miller. We already had her talk about it earlier. And the topic will be about the TAS Library. And public observing sessions have started. Again, go to texasastro.org for up-to-date information and details about meetings and public observing sessions. Now, slide number 10. Do any of you out there ha in Radio Land have any questions or need a fill on any of the information? Or maybe you just have a question uh, about general astronomy. I don't know. Come now with your call sign if you have a question or need a fill. Nothing. Okay, slide master, slide number 11. So as the moon waned at the end of July, so do these words for this segment of Skynet. Stay safe, keep well, pray for a world. It's the only one where humans live. And until next time, actually I'll be doing another segment on Skynet in a few minutes. Keep looking up so you know what's up. And this is KF5, JHA, Chaz, Vector, Net Control, Tom, KE5, ICX. It's all yours. Thank you, as always, for that, and we'll thank you again when the next segment when, uh, you come up after Miss Kelly, k 5 ATX. Uh, she's here to tell us about space exploration and space history, so Kelly, please go right ahead. Thank you, Tom. This is K5KTX. Good evening, everyone, again. So, poised to launch on Artemis 1 from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida, the BioSentinel, which is a shoebox-sized CubeSat, 
will perform the first long-duration biology experiment in deep space. Artemis missions at the moon will prepare humans to travel on increasingly farther and longer duration missions to destinations like Mars, and BioSentinel will carry microorganisms in the force form of yeast to fill critical gaps in knowledge about the health risk in deep space posed by space radiation. Space radiation is like a demolition derby on the nanoscale. High energy galactic cosmic rays and bursts of solar particles permeate deep space. These types of radiations can wreak havoc on electronics and living cells alike. BioSentinel's main job is to monitor the vital signs of yeast to see how they fare when exposed to deep space radiation. Because yeast cells have similar biological mechanisms to human cells, including DNA damage and repair, scrutinizing yeast in space will help us better understand the risk of space radi radiation to humans and other biological organisms and help us plan crewed exploration missions to the moon and beyond. Specifically, BioSentinel will study yeast cell growth and metabolic activity in radiation environment beyond low Earth, Earth orbit. BioSentinel is one of 10 secondary payloads, all of which are six unit CubeSats that have the rare opportunity to hitch a ride to deep space on Artemis One. These satellites are mounted within the Orion stage adapter aboard the Space Launch System or SLS rocket. Once ejected into space, they will carry out science and technology investigations. Among the select group, BioSentinel is the only CubeSat to carry a life science experiment. So far, the Apollo 17 mission to the moon holds the record for the longest duration human deep space flight. The 1972 mission lasted 12 and a half days, far shorter than future Mars missions that will take years to complete. Apollo 17 also carried NASA's most recent experiments to study terrestrial life in space beyond low Earth orbit. No space biology experiment nor astronaut has traveled beyond the Earth-Moon system bio destination. Within hours of launch, SLS will deploy BioSentinel in space. A few days later, the CubeSat will swing past the moon and fly the rest of its six to nine month mission orbiting around the sun. Once there, BioSentinel's team will peri periodically trigger week-long yeast studies. BioSentinel will beam the data to Earth via NASA's deep space network using a radio developed by NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Southern California. NASA will hold a trio of media teleconferences the week of August the 14th, that's this week coming up, to preview the science and technology payloads that will fly as part of the agency's Artemis One flight test. NASA also will provide live stream coverage of Artemis One's move to the launch pad ahead of its targeted no earlier than Monday, August the 29th liftoff. So be sure to visit NASA.gov to get all the latest on Artemis One. Now, in space history, there this past week, August the 8th, 2001, NASA's Genesis probe launched from Cape Canaveral. Its goal was to collect a sample of the solar wind from beyond the moon's orbit and return it back to Earth for further study. While in space, the craft pointed its detectors toward the sun where the particles of the solar wind became embedded. After 850 days of collection, the spacecraft returned to Earth. The sample return capsule was meant to be retrieved in midair. However, the parachute designed to slow the capsule failed, and the spacecraft crashed into the Utah desert at 193 miles per hour on September 8, 2004. While some of the sample collectors were contaminated by the crash, many were recovered and analyzed, increasing further our knowledge of the solar wind. On August the 10th, back in 1966, the Lunar Orbiter 1 spacecraft launched. It was designed to photograph smooth areas of the moon's surface to help select and verify safe landing sites 
for the surveyor and Apollo missions. One of three robotic precursor programs for the Apollo lunar landing effort, Lunar Orbiter was the most successful. Five Lunar Orbiter missions were launched and all of them were successful. The historic mission took the first photos of the Earth from the distance of the moon, the first Earthrise picture. Snapped the first close-up photos of the moon and photographed By 9% of the moon's surface, both near and far side, had been photographed with resolution down to one meter. On August the 11th, way back in 1877, astronomers in the 19th century were certain that Mars had no moon. Asaph Hall, an astronomer at the U.S. Naval Observatory in Washington, D.C., was not convinced. In August of 1877, he began his search. After a few failures and cloudy nights, however, he was on the verge of giving up. Encouraged by his wife, he decided to give it one more try. So on the night of August the 11th, 1877, he turned the U.S. Naval Observatory's giant 26-inch refractor telescope towards the sky again. Early in the morning at a roughly half past two, he spotted a faint, suspicious object near Mars. Due to cloudy skies and poor atmospheric conditions, the astronomer did not have a chance to confirm the sighting till a few days later. On the night of August 17th, as he looked eagerly to the skies waiting for the reappearance of the moon of Mars, he noticed a second suspicious object. After confirmation from his peers, Hall announced the, the discovery of two moons of Mars. Hall, following a suggestion made by an English chemist named Henry Maiden, named the two moons Phobos, which means fear, and Deimos, which means panic, the attendants of the god Mars as mentioned in Homer's Iliad. On August the 12th, 1977, Enterprise, the space shuttle prototype, made its first free flight at NASA's Armstrong Flight Research Center. were in attendance by Fred Hayes and Gordon Fullerton, separated from the Boeing 747 carrier and glided to a successful landing. Also on August the 12th, back in 2005, NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, or, or MRO, lifted off from pad SLC-41 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. This was the first time that a United Launch Alliance Atlas V had been used for a planetary mission. The spacecraft arrived at Mars the next spring, Mars, March of 2006, and joined three other orbiters, the Mars Global Surveyor, Mars Odyssey, and ESA's Mars Express, and two rovers on the surface, Spirit and Opportunity. After almost 16 and a half years in orbit, MRO is still collecting data with its instruments and serving as a communication relay for other craft. And this past week, we have several astronaut birthdays to celebrate. August the 7th, 1956, Kent Rominger, who was on space shuttle missions STS-73, 80, 85, 96, and 100. August the 7th, 1962, Jose Hernandez, who was a, a ham radio operator, KE-5DAV. He was on one mission, a space shuttle mission, which is STS-128. August the 11th, 1961, Frederick C.J. Serco was on space shuttle missions STS-88, 105, 117, and 128. He was also the pilot for the Virgin Galactic Spaceship 2 VSS Unity back in 2018, I believe. Um, August the 12th, 1951, happy birthday to Charles Brady, Jr. He was also a space, uh, an AM radio operator. A uh, silent key now, um, November for Bravo Quebec uh, whiskey. And then we have, and he was on space shuttle missions STS-78. And finally today, happy birthday, August the 13th, 1942, to Robert Stewart, who was on space shuttle missions STS-41B and 51J. And that's all I've got this evening. This is K5KTX. Back to you, Tom. Thank you, Ms.
Kelly for taking, uh, for giving us a little history lesson here, as well as uh, what's been going on in space. This is KE5 ICF and net control for Skynet. It's time for Jazz again. KF5JHA, what do you have for us for Miss Carolyn's Constellation of the Week? Thanks, Tom. It sounds like my last name is again. Jazz again? Oh, okay. Uh, slide master, slide number 12. Miss Carolyn's Constellation of the Week is named in honor of Silent Key, Silent Key Carolyn, KC5OZT. Carolyn contributed to Skynet each week, almost from its beginning in 2012 until May of 2019, with a detailed look at one particular constellation each week. Since there are about 52 easily visible constellations seen in Texas throughout the year, out of the 88 total constellations, so Ms. Carolyn covered the entire sky as seen over North Texas in a year. In her honor, we've continued that tradition of a constellation per week and named this segment after her. Ms. Carolyn's Constellation of the Week this week is Lyra the Harp. Now, Lyra represents a small hand harp called a lyre. You've probably seen a picture of an angel holding a harp, then you've seen a picture of a lyre. I, if I harp on this too much about this constellation, you might call me a liar. Slide master, slide number 13. Let me get into the jokes of the week. Why are harps like elderly parents? Both are unforgiving and hard to get into and out of cars. I actually have a music uh, section for harps at Brookhaven campus of Dallas College, and it's interesting watching the people that play harps getting them in and out of their cars, so that's pretty funny. How long does the harp stay in tune? 20 minutes or until somebody opens the door. You see, if the temperature changes at all, they get out of tune, like, immediately. Yeah, I have to explain them. I guess they're not any good. Mary, just like playing the harp, fill in the blank, looks easy until you try it. The and true both, yeah. Uh, what do you call a cow that plays the harp? A musician. You can call a cow playing anything a musician. Uh, what do you call a successful harpist? A harpist with a spouse that has two jobs. Too much call for them, yeah. So this is the last harp joke for tonight. <laughs> Just so I can string you along. And this is KF5JJ, and this is Skynet. Slide Master, slide number 14. There are several interesting stars on Lyra. Vega is being the fifth brightest star in the sky. Other interesting stars in Lyra include... Uh, Shellac, Zeta, Lyra, and Epsilon Lyra. Epsilon Lyra is the famous double-double, which is two pairs of stars. But I'll concentrate on other objects in Lyra. Slide master, slide number 15. M56 is a globular cluster that gets overlooked by many amateur astronomers. It is an easy target for binoculars as well as telescopes. It was discovered by Charles Messier himself on January the 19th, 1779. A pair of 20 by 80 binoculars can easily see a faint fuzzy ball. Uh, and an 8 inch or larger telescope at 100 power will resolve some of the outer stars in the cluster. If sky conditions permit, using 200 magnification, then you'll allow, you are allowed to be able to resolve the inner stars to the cluster. Remember that globular star clusters are old, forming at about the same time as our galaxy. And they have roughly the same size uh, stars, all about one solar mass in size uh, with all the stars in a globular cluster. Slide master, slide number 16. M57 is the famous ring nebula. 
It is a planetary nebula. Planetary nebulas have nothing to do with planets, but probably got their names from being round and shaped just like a planet in a telescope. Planetary nebula are formed at the end of a stellar lifetime uh, of a red giant star. A red giant swells and loses its outer layer, which becomes the round planetary nebula. Uh, what is left behind is the faint white dwarf star at the center of the nebula. M57 can be found in a three-inch telescope, but historically a six-inch or larger telescope usually has been needed to see the ring shape. I've seen M57 with my 20 by 80 binoculars, but it only looks almost starlight and as star-like in it. Slide number 17, please. White dwarf central star is difficult to see and requires quality optics, high magnification, dark skies, and steady seeing conditions, making it a challenging object. A minimum of 12 inch aperture is usually required, uh, though some have seen it in as small as a 9 or 10 inch telescopes with exceptional quality. At the 2018 Texas Star Party, a group of past members, myself included, observed the Ring Nebula along with a number of other objects using a 36-inch telescope at the McDonald Observatory. Using that instrument, we observed the central star of M57. Slide number 18. Just a year later, during the 2019 Texas Star Party, the McDonald Observatory made the historic 82-inch uh, auto Struve telescope available for those who signed up for a couple of special observing nights. Dennis Harwell and myself signed up for the Saturday morning session that went from 2 a.m. until 6.30 a.m. One of the objects we observed was M57, and I'm happy to report that the 82 inches of that aperture of that telescope turned the central star of M57 into a, from a challenging object into an easy object. It was fun to do. Slide master, slide number 19, please. is a barred spiral galaxy lying just five arc minutes northwest of M57. Discovered by famous astronomer E.E. E. Bernard, this 15th magnitude galaxy was mentioned by the late Walter Scott Houston, author of Deep Sky Wonders column in the Sky and Telescope magazine. Unfortunately, due to its proximity to M57, we also got to look at... Uh, Fortunately, not unfortunately, fortunately, due to the proximity of M57, we get to look at IC 1296 during the special observing session with the 82-inch telescope at the 2019 Texas Star Party. Just like it did for the central star of M57, the 82-inch changed IC 1296 from a challenge object into an easy object. And this is KFI, JJ, and this is Skynet. Slide master, slide number 20, please. There are more astronomical league observing program objects in the constellation of Lyra La Harp. I've just given you a sampling of a few of those objects. The astronomical league has over 70, well, I believe last time, 73 different observing programs when I counted them last, most of which have about 100 objects in it, give or take a, a dozen or two. If you observe just 10 different objects in an observing program each month, then over the course of a year, you can earn an observing certificate and a pen. Slide master, slide number 21, and that is Miss Carolyn's Constellation of the Week, Choir of the Harp. I want to thank my friends Dave Hutchinson and Dennis Harwell for the research and words on deep sky objects that I use, borrow, and steal free Skynet. Also, at times, I use the website constellation guide. Next time, I'll do them the shield and corona ostrona, the southern crown. And this is KF5JHA sending it back to our net control, Tom. Uh, Tom, I I if you were Grandpa Skynet, since I helped start Skynet, what am I called? Uh, the answer to that question is old, old, O-L-D.
to the old man, OM. Okay, this is KE5ICX, and I am uh, net control this evening. We're going to skip the uh, launches this week, uh, simply because of time. So we're going to rush over to Brenda, WB5OZL, and she has something for us over recent astronomical uh, discoveries. So Brenda, go ahead, from KE5ICX. Tom, this is WB5 OZL. This article is entitled, Signs of Disturbance in Nearby Dwarf Galaxies Indicate an Alternative Gravity Theory. Dwarf galaxies are small, faint galaxies that can usually be found in galaxy clusters or near larger galaxies. Because of this, they might be affected by the gravitational effects of their larger companions. We introduce an innovative way of testing the standard model based on how much dwarf galaxies are disturbed by gravitational tides from the nearest larger galaxies, says Elena Asensio, PhD student at the University of Bonn and the lead author of the story. Tides arise when gravity from one body pulls differently on different parts of another body. These are similar to tides on Earth, which arise because the moon pulls more strongly on the side of the Earth, which faces the moon. The Fornax cluster has a rich population of dwarf galaxies. Recent observations show that, show that some of these dwarfs appear distorted, as if they have been perturbed by the cluster environment. Since such Perturbations in the Fornax dwarfs are not expected according to the standard model, said uh, Pavel Krupa, professor at the University of Bonn and Charles University in, pra in Prague. Just because, according to the standard model, the dark matter halos of these stars should partly shield them from tides raised by the cluster. The authors analyze the expected level of disturbance of the dwarfs, which depends on their internal properties and their dis distance from the gravitational powerful cluster center. Galaxies with large sizes but low stellar masses and galaxies close to the cluster center are more easily disturbed or destroyed. Compare the results with their observed level of disturbance evident from photographs taken by the VLT Survey Telescope of the European Southern Observatory. The comparison showed that one wants to explain the observations in the standard model, said Alenio Elena Asensio, the Fornax dwarfs should already be destroyed by gravity from the cluster center even when the tides it rises on a dwarf are 64 times weaker than the dwarf's own self-gravity. Not only is this counterintuitive, she says, which found that the external force needed to disturb a dwarf galaxy is about the same as the dwarf's self-gravity. From this, the authors concluded that in the standard model, it is not possible to explain the observed morphologies of the Fornax Fornax doors in a self-consistent way. They repeated the analysis using Milgromian dynamics, MOND. Instead of assuming dark matter halos surrounding galaxies, the MOND theory proposes a correction to Newtonian dynamics by which gravity experiences a boost in the regime of low acceleration. We're not sure that the dwarf galaxies would be able to survive the extreme environment of the galaxy cluster in MOND due to the absence of protective dark matter halos in this model, admitted Dr. Indranil ben, uh, Benick from the University of St. Andrews. But our results show a remarkable agreement between observations and the MOND expectations for the level of disturbance of the Fornax dwarfs. It is exciting to see that the data we obtained from the VLT Survey Telescope allowed such a, a thorough test of cosmological models, said Aku Benhoa from the University of 
uh, Oulu, Finland, and Stefan Meiske from the European Southern Observatory, co-authors of the study. This is not the first time that a study testing the effect of dark matter on the dynamics and evolution of galaxies concluded that observations are better explained when they are not surrounded by dark matter. The number of publications showing incompatibilities between observations and the dark matter paradigm just keeps increasing every year. It is time to start investing more resources into promising theories, said Pavel Krupa, member of the Transdisciplinary Research Area's Modeling and Matter of the University of Bonn. Dr. Hongshin Zhao of the University of St. Andrews added, our results have major implications for fundamental physics. We expect to find more disturbed dwarfs and other clusters, a prediction by which other teams should, or a prediction of which other teams should verify. This is from sciencedaily.com, back to net, WB5OZL. Thank you for that report. This is KE5ICX, Net Control for the Night Skynet. Tell you what, we, now I do have some time, so let's go ahead and take additional check-ins. Anybody like to join us this evening, please come now with your call sign, your name, where you're transmitting from. This is Alpha Alpha 5 Alpha Hotel, Robert Richardson. Up one more, that makes 24, AA5AH, Robert Richardson, have you checked in? Okay, next up, last thing we're going to do this evening is visible satellite passages over the next couple of days. ISS struck out this week, I don't have anything really exciting for you. We do have the Tian Gong Space Station, which now has a second module attached to it, three tacky knots on board, I do believe, and uh, they... Uh, the is 2.2 magnitude. This is over the Dallas area, obviously. 21.44 local time. It starts its pass out of the west-southwest, reaches its highest point at 82 degrees uh, overhead, 21.47, and it will fall at 21.47.48, so it goes into shadow. August 15th, one, minus 1.9 magnitude, 20.44 of the southwest, will reach its highest point at 20.47, and it will fall at 20.50 degrees. Next up is August 16th, minus 1.1 magnitude out of the west at 2120. It'll reach its highest point at 44 degrees at 2123, and it'll fall to the northeast at 2126. That would be August 16th. So next up is uh, the X-37. That is the uh, secret Space Force winged spacecraft looking much like a mini version of the shuttle. Uh, this thing's been in orbit, I believe, three years now. I, I think there's two of them, maybe three. At any rate, uh, it has a pass on August 16th. This one's a point two magnitude at 5.51 a.m. And out of the west-northwest. It'll reach its highest point almost directly overhead at 5.54, and it'll fall at 5.56 to the south. And again, there's uh, another uh, pass on August the 19th. That one's 0.3 magnitude at 21.37 out of the west-southwest, reaches its highest point at 77 degrees at 21.40. It falls at 21.40.22. Again, that one falls into shadow as well. Envisat, old reliable. If everybody else is uh, coming up empty, the Envisat satellite does indeed have some some good passes always because it's a polar satellite and it is a polar orbit satellite and it's very big. First one is August 13th at 3.1 magnitude at 547 out of the north northeast it reaches highest point at 80 degrees at 552 at east southeast at 557 it will fall to the south. So we have August 15th. There are actually two better ones, 3.2 magnitude in the uh, morning at 612 out of the north, 
reaches highest point at 617 at 55 degrees and falls at 622 to the south-southwest. Following evening, 3.5 magnitude, 535 a.m. Out of the north-northeast, reaches highest point at 540 at 60 degrees and it will fall to the south at 545. Uh, next is August 18th. This will be the last one for this evening. 3.0 magnitude at 6 o'clock even in the morning. Uh, out of the north, it reaches its highest point at uh, 6.05 at 74 degrees. And it will fall to the south-southwest at 6. So let's see here. Um, that's pretty much it. I've got four minutes left. Does anyone have any questions that we can answer before we close up? Please come with your call. Okay, we'll go ahead and close it out then. Uh, tonight we had 24 hams participating, including your lovely net control. That would be me. Thank you, the old man. Thank you for uh, to all who checked in this evening. We will Hope you'll join us here next week and every Saturday night at 9 p.m. to discuss astronomy, space, and space exploration on this net. The sky is never the limit. We're always looking for net control stations for this and all the other DARC nets. If you'd like to try your hand at it and contact any of the net controls by sending an email to nets at w5fc.org. Trust me, it is fun. You can follow topics and discussion about this net, astronomy in general, on Facebook, Twitter, as well as our audio video streams, video archives, and other useful internet resources by going to the club website, you guessed, w5fc.org, at the conclusion of this net. Until next Saturday night, this is Kilo Echo 5, India Charlie X-Ray Top, and I'll be closing the net at 22.28 local time, returning to Petersburg. Normal use for another five minutes. 73, everybody, and enjoy the evening discovering the universe. Come back in five minutes. We will discuss tonight's movie. The Afterglow movie is Invasion USA from 1952. What a winner. So, see you in five. This is KE5. let all of you know. Go outside, take a look at the moon. It's over there in the uh, uh, east, southeastern sky. The gibbous moon's rising. Jupiter's right on the eastern horizon rising, so they're not too far apart from each other. Uh, Saturn is high in the southeastern sky. Well, not that high, but it's part of the way up, about one-third of the way up in the southeastern sky. So go out and before you get into listening to the Afterglow movie. This is KF5, JHA. I'm completely operational. All my circuits are functioning perfectly. Afterglow movie net. And this is just a little warning. We'll be starting the Afterglow Movie Net in just a couple of minutes. If you'd like to use the repeater, now is your time. NT5 TM.
Hello, Tony. I hope this is a short afterglow. Because it's such a bad, bad movie. Inside EB. Well, you know, Bill, that's that's kind of up to you and the other participants. How bad is it? How badly do you want to tell the rest of us? I tell you, I talk about reused footage, reused World War II footage. See you in a minute. Good evening and welcome to this session of the DFW Metroplex Afterglow Movie Net. My name is Tony, NT5TM, and tonight I'll be your net control station. This net is a local affiliate of the National Movie Criticism System. Our purposes are to move traffic into and mostly out of the DFW area by criticizing them so vigorously that they can never come back. This net welcomes all licensed stations to participate. This is a directed net, therefore please do not transmit without direction from net control. I do ask that you use ITU phonetics, unless you know funnier ones, and please ID at the end of your transmissions. Actually, that part's serious, that's how I know you're done talking. Stations that need to check out of the net should do so by rechecking with net control, indicating their need to secure, and also indicating what should be done with any remaining movie refreshments. Stations with emergency or priority traffic may enter the net at any time, although why on earth did you wait, by using the pro words break, break, followed by their call sign. Let's go ahead and get folks checked in to the Afterglow movie net. Okay, first, uh, before we call for a plot synopsis, we will need a plot synopsis soon, but not quite yet, I'd like to take check-ins from short-time stations, short-time and mobile stations. Folks who have to go away soon but who might have something to say about our fine cinematic masterpiece tonight. Do we have any short timers for the Afterglow movie net? If so, come now with your call sign phonetically, your name, and let me know if you saw the movie. Okay, I'll try one more time. Any short time stations for the Afterglow movie net? If so, please come now. Call sign phonetically. Name, and did you see the so called movie? Okay, well, no one is admitting to being a timer. So, Tom, KE5 ICX. Uh, could you give us a synopsis of tonight's movie? Oh, of course I can. Um, I, I've already given my version of it, but I will give you the Wikipedia version so that you have some idea what the heck is really going on or not going on. So here it is. I'm running 
a little horse tonight. <laughs> and it's really a pony. Uh, in a, a New York City bar, the brooding, mysterious forecaster, Mr. Oldman, played by Dan Ho, here Lucy is sitting and drinking from a very large brandy glass. It's gigantic. He gets into a discussion with a cross section of the affluent Americans at the bar, including a local television newscaster, Vince Potter, played by Gerald Moore, who I really love. He played the devil in Visit to Hades in Washington Space. Beautiful young New York society woman, Carla Sanford, played by Peggy Castle, a California industrious and rancher from Arizona, I think it'd be Texas, and a congressman. International news is bad, but the Americans do not want to hear it. What they all dislike, while they all dislike communism and appreciate material wealth they enjoy, they also want lower taxes and fail to see the need for industrial support of government. As he swishes the brandy around in his sister, Omen tells the others that many Americans want safety and insecurity but do not want to make any sacrifices for it. Suddenly, the news becomes worse. The enemy is staging air attacks over Steel Point, Alaska, and then no paratroopers have landed on Alaskan airfields soon. Near civilian areas, while military airfields are A-bombed, the U.S. fights back and attacks the enemy's homeland with Convair B-36 missions, but the enemy steadily moves into Washington State and Oregon. Shipyards in Pugin Sound have been nuclear strike with casualties. Meanwhile, the Americans at the bar scramble to return to their lives to do what they can against the enemy now that it is too late. Potter and Sanford fall for each other. War or no war, people have to eat and drink and make love. He continues to broadcast while she volunteers to help a flood drive. The industrialist and the rancher both return home to find themselves on the front line. The former is caught in a battle for San Francisco, the latter in the destruction of Boulder Dam by a nuclear missile. The U.S. president, whose face is never shown in a front view, only in a rear view, makes influent, ineffectual broadcasts with inflated claims of counterattacks to rally the morale of the people. The enemy continues to advance with stealth attacks by troops dressed in American uniforms, including a paratrooper attack on the U.S. Capitol that kills the congressman. New York is A-bombed, and Potter is soon killed during the broadcast. A Stanford threatened with rape by an enemy, enemy soldier. He orders her, you are my women now, narrowly escapes his assault as she jumps from the balcony, presumably to her death. <gasps> Suddenly, the image of her falling body appears in Omen's brandy sniffer. All five suddenly find themselves back in the bar since they had just emerged from a hypnotic estate that Omen had induced. After reassuring themselves that the recent events, including their deaths, did not really happen, they hurry off to take measures to boost military preparedness. Potter and Sanford resume their romance. Uh, yeah. And there you have it, the whole story. Don't forget, Tom Kennedy played Tim, the bartender, probably the most important role in this movie and probably the most inspirational character. It made me want to start thinking again. Oh, well. Okay, Tony, uh, back to you. This is KE5 ICS. Well, thank you, Tom, very much. I appreciate that summary, and uh, I will admit I was more interested in Mr. O'Herlihy, uh, however you say his name. I was pretty sure I'd seen him in some other things, and I'm darn sure I can prove I'm right. Okay, let's go ahead and take general check-ins. Anyone, whether you've seen the movie, yes, movies in quotes, or not, if you'd like to join us, please come now. I'd like your call sign phonetically. Your name. And if you saw tonight's cinematic masterpiece, or not, either kind of check-in is welcome. Please come now. November 5, Bravo, Bravo. Bill and Irving. I saw it!
you know, golf five, Bravo to the whiskey chain, there with I I saw the dog. Hello, India five, Sierra X ray Echo, Brandon out of Wiley, and uh I saw the film. Echo 5 is... I saw the song. Bravo 5, Oscar Zulu Lima, Brenda and DeSoto, I saw this movie. And I will make an admission here that I technically saw the whole movie, but I emphasize saw because after a while I turned the sound off and was just looking for vintage aircraft. Uh, I heard N5BB, Bill and Irving, KG5, BZ, BZW, J and Weatherford, KI5, Sierra, X-Ray, Echo, Brandon, did I get your call right? Roger, Roger, you got it right. Uh, that's QSL. Okay, very good. And then I heard Tom, KE5, ICX, and Louisville, and Brenda, WB5OZL. All of you saw the movie. I wonder how many of you listened to it or took notes. Hopefully, mostly you didn't. Uh, anyone else? Anyone else who'd like to join us for the Afterglow Movie Net, please come now. Call sign phonetically. Your name. And did you see the movie? We're talking about Invasion USA from 1952 or any other Red Scare movie you'd like to talk about. Please come now. Okay, I heard a Kirk Shunk, but eh, no voice. I am watching Echolink chat as well. I'll pause one more time here, and then I'll start calling on people uh, for round one, the plot. The plot, which I guess also includes, you know, screenwriting. Uh, anyone else, please come now, especially if I haven't called on you and you tried to check in earlier. Kilo India 5, Kilo Whiskey Golf, this is Cruz in Arlington, yes I saw the film. Oh Cruz, I'm sorry for you too, but then you're probably sorry for the rest of us. Uh, thank you for checking in. Okay, uh, we're talking about round one, which is the plot. Also, comments on screenwriting. Uh, as net control, I get to go last, and I'm going to go back up the list here, at least for this round, in reverse order, just for fun. Uh, so, KI5, Kilo Whiskey, Quebec. Cruz, you're first. What did you think of the plot and or the screenplay? KWG. Uh, thanks, Tony. Um, wasn't prepared to go first. That's why I always wait towards the end. My, my actual notes that I took on this uh, concerning the plot really had more to do with the screenplay, I think, at least in my mind. Um, a lot of people in denial kind of had underlined here. I got suspicious early on um, when the scene with the major talking about tank production to the tractor manufacturer. And uh, I, I was thinking, you know, this is a little unrealistic here. Because um, it was pretending that defense contracts are not lucrative, and they certainly are. Um, and then it later contradicted that, you know, admitted through another character, you know, the, the filthy capitalist is going to make money for the bank. Uh, um, and then the other part of that was is, is that scene would have been so utterly unconstitutional to try to impress the villains. 
And uh, so I looked up the author, and I thought that we, that was uh, an interesting uh, insight I found in there, and that he was uh, born in Austria and escaped Germany because of the Nazis in the 1930s, went to Britain originally, I believe. And uh, so I thought, okay, he's got in mind as he's writing this screenplay, he's got in mind uh, a bunch of different themes that he's trying to work in for an American audience. But it would include that uh, that German Austrian uh, civilian acedia, or the indifference, the apathy to the rise of a totalitarian military uh, uh, state. And uh, but at the same time, he's over here in in, uh, in, in this time in post-war um, U.S. and he's beginning to see uh, kind of satisfied. Uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, with things, materialistic, that's the word I was looking for, um, materialistic uh, society developing where it was as if war was all past us. And I think he was trying to make a comment on that. I thought he did a pretty good job. I, I thought the, the storyline was, was, uh, was fairly good. And uh, so I'm not saying that's my favorite movie. But, but I actually kind of like it. That's what I've got. So back to you, Matt, KI5KWG. Okay, KI5KWG from NT5TM. I'm really glad I went backwards because I didn't have any idea that the screenwriter was Austrian, which, yes, in 1952 kind of puts a different light on it. Uh, that they that the author was probably a bit more philosophical than the average screenwriter uh, and worried about both apathy and American materialism. Uh, yeah, I, I really did not think that deeply about it. So I think you did a great job as leadoff commenter, and I really appreciate that. Next up is WB5 OZL and then KE5 ICX. Uh, Brenda, WB5 OZL, what do you think about the plot or the screenplay? This is WB5OZL. Well, uh, the uh, the side of that TWA Connie is probably worth the price of admission. I loved all the old airplanes. You, you all know I'm an airplane nut, and uh, that was fabulous. Of course, it was free. This this movie made money, and it's probably because it was most probably 80% stock footage that they didn't have to pay for. But that's okay. I love stock footage. And the, I think the, oh, it was all a dream, or they were all hypnotized, it was such a cop-out, and it, you know, in the end you go, what? But, you know, the, yeah, I agree with the idea of, well, we can't make money if we make for the military. Yes, you can, uh, and it's, it's been that way for decades, and it's still that way now, if you, if you want to make a lot of money, get government contracts. So I, maybe they didn't, maybe the Austrian didn't know how that works in America. But, I, okay, this movie was made in 1952. Were they not aware that we were in the Korean War, maybe? Uh, they never mentioned that. I uh, don't know if that ever figured into it. And it, Seemed, they seemed very detached from World War II, which in 1952 was still a dominant feature in American psyche. Uh, you know, they mentioned the war. That's what they're talking about. It, it was, the, you know, very often just subject of casual discussion about the war and shortages and people getting shell-shocked, people uh, being injured or dying or you know, living here or there, and these um, people acted like, kind of like war was remote to them. Now, 
I'm, maybe I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I had a hard time following this. When he did a scoreboard to tell us who is who, we just saw planes and tanks and soldiers and parachutes, and sometimes I wasn't really sure who was who, so I wasn't quite sure who was winning. But uh, it wasn't the worst movie I've ever seen. It was kind of dumb, yeah. And a lot of it was cliched. It certainly gives us something. All right, back to net. WB follows it out. Yes, uh, I, I'll talk more about the vintage planes. Uh, which isn't really my thing, but I'm, I'm changing my thing because of all these old movies we watch. Uh, I was especially struck, yes, by the, the, that kind of apathy about the war, that woman, the glamorous woman who said, well, I tried working in a defense plant, but it, it made my hands hurt. She said something about it hurt the complexion of her hands or something. And I just can't imagine someone having made that admission in that year and expecting not to be uh, uh, at least to have people staring daggers at her. So... Uh, yeah, it, it, lots and lots of stock footage. We kind of need a museum of stock footage. Uh, maybe someone on the net knows about such a thing, but there was a lot of that. And it would be fun to just watch a good compilation of interesting stock footage without having to deal with an actual movie. KE5ICX, Tom, you're up in a second, and then KI5SXE, Brandon and Wiley, and then uh, KG5BZW, Jay and Weatherford, and then we're all the way back to N5BB. Uh, and then I'll get my comments and call for more check-ins. Uh, Tom, go ahead. Very good. Thank you, Tony. And thank you for taking the net this evening. I really do appreciate it. Uh, it was uh, starting to lose my voice. It just worked out that it was the perfect, uh, what do you want to call it, uh, the, the perfect storm. Uh, a couple of things. First off, uh, your comments about stock footage. Oh, yeah, that exists. I think there's companies that uh, provide it. Uh, certainly, um, um, uh, television uh, shows and, and that have, have that stuff available so that they can fill in. By the way, just this, there's huge compilations of music that are reused in different movies. Uh, I, I mean, in different television shows, CBS has a, a huge collection of that stuff. In fact, sometimes some of the albums, you know, I'm a big uh, soundtrack fan, uh, that's where they find some of the sourced materials as they go back into the CBS archives, which are done and pressed as 33 RPM records, and then you just, whatever track you wanted that fit, and it could be composed by any, anybody. It could have been a Jerry Goldsmith or, or uh, Johnny Williams or, you know, one of the one of the guys. And that's how they reconstruct some of these older, uh, obscure uh, uh, scores. But I digress. At any rate, uh, one thing that I think that maybe we're forgetting, I'm not sure, there's some small elements in here that I thought were kind of interesting. One was the big, gigantic uh, Admiral... Uh, Painting, I mean, moving picture, uh, television set, whatever the hell that thing was, and, and the control, no television was that big back in 1952 that I'm aware of, I could be wrong, but I thought it was rather interesting, which suggested to me that maybe this is in the future. I know that's a bit of a, of a, of a stretch, but I, I think that might have something to do with it, um, and here's my reason why, let me reset. It's only been seven years since the end of World War II, and we ended the, the Nazi, uh, uh, you know, march on the world, war on the world. But then after that, immediately thereafter, uh, we we had um, the Soviet Union, which was busy consolidating. Occupied to where they had liberated people and then decided, well, well, to keep this, and this became a real issue. And, and uh, Truman had to, to really deal with a lot of these uh, problems, which became the Cold War. So that had happened immediately after the war. Well, 
people were getting a little paranoid about these things, and, and they were concerned about it. But our group here isn't concerned at all. Why? I don't know. Maybe they, uh, maybe it is the future. Maybe it's far in the future. And what they're trying to say in the film, in a not so thinly veiled way, is that uh, being ever vigilant. And don't forget the George Washington quote about uh, uh, is the best prepared uh, for war so that we can live in peace. I paraphrase amazingly, uh, just to make sure you didn't get the point through the uh, hour and ten minutes of the film. I agree with everyone. This always happens when we get a film like this where we have tons of stock footage. The problem is, is you're trying to make your story sit around stock footage that's there, and it gets very confusing, particularly when a lot of the footage is of American aircraft, and then a few MiGs here and there, MiG-17 show up, and then they go back to American aircraft, and then we go to uh, that are supposed to be the, uh, the enemy. Obviously, they're not. If you know what they are, it gets very confusing. And, of course, all of the bombing and everything, well, you know, old, well, whenever they started interacting with each other, then it got really confusing. And nobody knew who was fighting who. So that's a problem. Another thing that happens is the story just kind of flows to a crawl when they're doing all these fantastic uh, stock footage parts. And you're like, oh, I don't know. What are they bombing? And and they throw some, some drawing that they created of, uh, out of a dam and, and New York and all that. That was a bit much. And of course, the few sets that they had were kind of boring. The, the, the bar was pretty much, well, that's a technical thing, but it, it, daylight, darkness, I don't know, it was kind of strange, and these people never leave, and Another thing is, is that if they're evacuating the city or they're worried about things happening, why aren't people, I don't know, coming in off the streets to find out what's going on? Back then, before the interwebs and all of that, the first thing you would do is duck into a bar to find out what's going on because there's always a TV on in the bar and find out that during the Apollo program, people routinely, well, in Apollo 11, they all up bars to find out what was going on. That was pretty pretty standard stuff. I would think that an invasion of the United States would bring in more than, what, five people into a bar? It should have been a mob scene. But that's just me. What do I know? Okay, I've talked enough. Uh, okay, E5 ICS. Well, Tom, thank you. But, yeah, I was hoping you were going to tell me the URL of the Internet stock uh, footage uh, library uh, extravaganza, but that's okay. Uh, it may all be hidden in the bowels of film studios where they don't let us see it. Uh, uh, people with copyrights are like that. And and yes, uh, there are a couple of forms of that. Uh, people have been saying eternal vigilance is the price of liberty since at least 1817, although it's kind of an apocryphal quote. It was first attributed to Thomas Jefferson, who never said it, according to Thomas Jefferson, uh, it seems to have just become shortened from various other speeches uh, in the early 1800s. Uh, there's also the very, very famous, uh, how do I say this, Sewis uh, Packham uh, Parabella, uh, if you want peace, prepare for war, which means about the same thing. People often forget both. Uh, there's a kind of ammunition named Parabellum after that. Uh, KI5SXE, Brandon in Wiley, followed by JN Weatherford, and then last but never least is N5BB. Uh, but up right now is Brandon. Go ahead. What do you think of the plot or the screenwriting? Uh, for the plot, uh, I, I stuck through it. Um, I'm glad I did because had I turned the sound off and not watched the end, I think I would have missed the point of the entire movie other than you know, the fact that they made mistakes in their lives and then they all had to die. Um, I, I mean, I really just thought it was, uh, like, a, I don't know, some type of, like, fantasy horror movie where everyone dies in the end. Like, it could have been called Everybody Dies um, because of just the ridiculous ways they went out. But um, in the end, I think it tied it all back together. 
you know, letting the movie have a point um, and kind of that aha moment other than pointless death. Um, I think I do like the, uh, the futuristic um, anonymity to it, right? Like, it, they did talk about communism, but if you kind of listen, uh, everything was very vague about the enemy, the locations, and, like, what they were attacking, etc. When it came down to it, I think uh, they might have thought they were going to cut some of the communism portions in post-production. Uh, of the movie uh, as we go, but that's about all I have in terms of plot. Um, looking forward to the rest of it. Over. Okay, very good. If you just want to give me your call sign to make sure we're legal. Yeah, Roger. Sorry, I forget it's late. Uh, Kilo India 5, Sierra Extra Echo, back to net control. Thank you, yes, uh, and I got from the Wikipedia article, One Thing Leads to the Other on the Internet, I found an, uh, an, a YouTube video of an actual LP somebody made called The Complacent Americans, uh, and it literally features, you know, various sound effects of traffic jams and people trying to evacuate cities, and someone's ghost is floating around saying, oh, I see those other people alive in the bomb shelter, and I realize if I'd lived my life better, I could be one of them too. Uh, it, it has that same kind of theme to it, you know, we, we need to wake up or else it will be our own fault. Uh, KG5 uh, BZW, Jay, go ahead. This is KG5 BZW. Um, yeah, it's interesting we're talking about the... the, the um, uh, in my mind, I classified it as uh, Charles Dickens' moment, uh, or you know, uh, uh, not that Charles Dickens isn't known for other stuff, but uh, the um, uh, oh, I'm a brain fart. The um, Christmas Carol book, uh, you know, uh, which also, you know. Earlier film, just uh, well, no, not really. Um, yeah, yeah, no, that that's a little bit different. I won't, I'll, I'll, I'll never forget what I was just gonna say there. Um, yeah, it, it, I, 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 it was an interesting film. <laughs> um, the, uh, yeah, the, 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 the 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 ending was obvious. It, it it was not really satisfactory. I mean, if they were hypnotized, what about those people that died? You know, in their supposed hypnotism, what were they doing while you know the story progressed? What that just it no <laughs> no. I I I did I did kind of a feel like it was kind of a there's a certain. Um, I don't know. Interesting uh, char, well, not really charm. Uh, uh, well, uh, bravery. I don't know what to call it. And having all the the characters die like that, which you, you don't really normally see, unless it's of course it's a nightmare scenario thing. It never by. Um, uh, it comes and and you know it's like oh it's all a dream and what not. I, so I, I I I should have guessed it was that was what was going to happen after maybe a few of the deaths, but um um because that does seem to happen a lot. It, I don't know for for films in that era if that's what happened a lot, but it does seem to be the case that if if a lot of characters start dying and, and it just gets really bad they're just gonna uh you know have some magic uh clear, clear display and then everybody's back to normal i mean i've seen i've seen modern writing like that it, it's it's dumb and uh, it, there's a lot left to be desired 
when that's uh, used, but hey, whatever. Um, memory is set. Sorry, echo links being a little bit weird. Um, other than that, eh, I don't know. I, I think I've said the, the biggest part I wanted to say. I mean, yeah, you've got the, the footage, the very extended World War II footage, which, you know, by that time, uh, we were... We were well into the jet age. I don't know how many, I, I, I'll admit, I don't know how much uh, uh, we are, we're, we're transitioning to that. Uh, I um, I was actually, what was it, 1948 when the, there's a, I don't know, there's a recent uh, post on, uh, on Facebook, uh, uh, talking about uh, some uh, co competition, Tuskegee Airmen, and all that, and some of the uh, uh, the, the uh, aircraft used at that point. Um, I won't go into that, but um, yeah, it, it seems like uh, I can't even remember the date. There's a lot of stuff I could have taken notes on. I, I did, it seems actually. Especially on the 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 uh, old footage, but uh, other than that, I think I, I'm going. I, I don't really have anything else intelligible or intelligent to say. Uh, so I'll hand it back to the next control uh, NT5 TM to schedule five BCW. Thank Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, it was, there was some interesting uh, stuff there, but yeah, on the whole, it was all a dream. It was under hypnotism. Uh, it's always kind of bad. And yeah, that's a good point also about too many people dying. Everyone can die at the end of a Chinese movie or a Japanese movie. But in a Hollywood movie, if everyone dies, you know, something's up, it may not be real. Uh, American conventions are different. That's a very good point. Okay, last on the initial check-in list is N5BB, Bill in Irving. Bill, what did you think about the plot or the screenplay? Go ahead. Bill says, bah humbug. This is N5BB. Uh, a number of things bothered me about this movie, okay? One is the overall plot is, it's one of these dream sequence kind of things that involves several people. And it involves, it isn't like The Wizard of Oz where it's all from Dorothy's, Dorothy? Yeah, her point of view. Instead, it's from each of their point of views, all these little vignettes with the different actors and what's happening. I don't know. That didn't exactly... That just didn't make any sense. And uh, he hypnotized them, but did he plant all those things in his in their brain? Uh, the guy in the bar, the bartender didn't seem to notice that was occurring. There was some hint right at the start of the movie that this guy was some kind of hypnotist or fortune, fortune teller, they called him. At the end of the movie, he just seemed this enigmatic character. Who was he? Who was that masked man? Uh, that bothered me. The other, other things that bothered me, there's a lot of things that bothered me. To me was he. It wasn't they. It was he. He's doing this. He's doing that. He's coming in. He's got airplanes. He. That terminology just bugged me. I don't know why, but it just so unnatural to me. I do not know. Maybe the Austrian guy that wrote it was, maybe that made sense in German or something. 
I don't know. I, I have no idea why you insisted on calling the enemy he. Four. There's much else I don't like. Um, you noticed, in fact, they commented about this several times, that the enemy, he, was dressing up, they were wearing United States uniforms. In fact, we even see the henchmen, the bad guys, talking about doing that. Make sure they're all dressed in American Air uniforms. Why? Why? It doesn't... There's only one place when they were near the... Um, uh, when they were in Washington, D.C., where they were trying... that we see them trying to fool troops into being Americans. During the early part of the movie, uh, they're out there fighting. They're in aircraft. They're coming in on ships. They're shooting guns. It's obvious they're going to be he. I did, what were they wearing American uniforms? I think I know this. I think it was a production problem. I think they had all this footage that showed troops. American insignia on them, airplanes and other kinds of things. So they just threw this into the movie. Oh, by the way, the enemy all oh, looks like Americans, and maybe they even look like American planes, because that's the stock footage they had. Ah. Didn't seem to see stock footage of Russian troops and things. All the stock footage of, I think, American stuff. So I think that's why they did that. And again, that bothered me. I mean, who in the world attacking somewhere would dress all their troops in, in the uh, other countries' uniforms? Um, and the, they kept talking about the locations initially being around Puget, Puget Sound and Oregon. Oregon coast, not eastern Oregon, which is kind of volcanic. Western Oregon. Uh, and and, and uh, Washington State. Guess what? Didn't look anything like the scenes they showed. Some of the scenes were nearly desert. There were no trees. There was, in many cases, no water. Didn't look like the Oregon and um, and uh, Washington coast at all. So to me, that was just disingenuous. They used footage that had nothing to do with the supposed location. I think they're probably maybe even filmed in Pacific Islands. A lot of them could have been filmed there. Who knows? Um, the, um, another thing, they kept talking about jets. They're coming in in swift wing jets. So they showed a few views of jet aircraft. If you notice, essentially, I think all the times, you don't see the jet aircraft going down in flames. You see prop airplanes going down in flames. Sometimes the distance was hard to tell. So I think they were using World War II uh, footage um, of prop airplanes going down in flames and shooting them up and flak and everything. Then later on in the movie, when they're showing the airplanes coming attacking, they're just showing pl uh, movies of, uh, you know, modern jet aircraft at that point. Those jet aircraft were just being introduced right at the end of World War II. They didn't really make any effect. And they weren't really... Uh, very widespread until the very late 40s and the early, very early 50s. So, um, no, I, I don't know. I found that very disingenuous. But they could use their stock footage in 5BB. What else bothered me? Um, oh, all the atomic bombs. Oh, they've got a thousand atomic bombs. Oh, they got atomic bomb here, atomic bomb there don't really see what looks like atomic bombs. They only speak a little bit of, of radiation. Well, by 1952, they knew about radiation. I don't know. This didn't make any sense to me. It's like they're using several atomic bombs in, 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 uh, 
in uh, New York City. Well, I don't know. They didn't say they were like atomic artillery shells. They said they were dropping them from bombers like atomic bombs. Uh, I think it would have caused much more damage. Early in the movie, it's like, oh, the planes are appearing from nowhere. So it's like they didn't have radar or long-distance radar, but we had that. So that was also rather disingenuous. They just, oh, man, they're, they're appearing here. We didn't see them coming. Well, they would have known they were coming by then. They had long-distance radar by then. And it was very active in the late 40s and early 50s because of the threat from the Soviet Union. Uh, what else bothers me? Oh, um, the um, the uh, love interest, uh, Peggy Castle and uh, Gerald Moore. Look, that's their real actor names. So Carla and Vince, the love interest. But what do they do? Uh, they go up into his apartment. Wow, there's bombing. There's bombs falling outside. Guess what? Bad idea to go inside when the bombs are falling. You want to go out of the buildings because they're going to collapse on you. That didn't make any sense. And people knew about that. I mean, look at what happened in World War II and in, in Europe. What else bothered me? Oh, the president. From the back or the front? From the front. I looked in the thing. He was not credited, the guy that did it. So I think they purposely did that so they didn't have to pay him. As you never saw a full, full, a full scale because he wasn't credited in the movie. It seemed very cheap to me to do that. And they would never have all this TV film coverage of a president in, in a severe wartime situation not looking at the camera. I was bothered by the movie. That's all I got for now in 5DB. NT5TM here is net control for the Saturday Night Afterglow net. Oh, Bill, you hit on several things that were in my notes. Uh, yes, I, I really do honestly believe, I mean, I can't read their minds. They're probably mostly dead by now, but I really do believe that was just a save on cost. I saw about two seconds of footage in this movie that I think actually might have showed MiG-15s. Everything else was old footage of American aircraft. And, and yeah, I mean, there, there was a lot of obscure stuff. A lot of these fighters, I think I mentioned this in a different net, that weren't in World War II and didn't fight in Vietnam have been largely forgotten. Uh, because they didn't see much combat, uh, and so we don't talk about them much. Uh, we had the P-80 shooting star. Uh, we had the C-119 flying boxcar dropping all those paratroops. You know, you never, you never see a, a flying boxcar anymore. Uh, there was no flying uh, uh, box. There was no flying pancake. I'm sad about that. Uh, we did see some Grumman F-9F Panthers and F-9 Cougars. The your fighters ever, largely because it didn't really do much that was historically important. Uh, so yeah, I think they were saving on cost. We would see a B-36, uh, the, the B-36, the aluminum overcast, one of the biggest bombers ever flown, take off, and then somehow in the air it would turn into a B-29, and you'd see the enemy looking through a Norden bomb site like we used in World War II uh, to drop 500-pound general-purpose bombs on, Amer on, on cities, which were allegedly all atomic bombs. Uh, the stock footage was kind of fun to, to, to plane spot, but very confusing. And yes, I had a big note. Who films the president from behind? Uh, you're going to lose your press credentials over that. Uh, so, yeah, a as you can tell from all the comments I've been giving to other people's uh, observations, I did not approve of this movie. 
uh, and I thought it was largely just a compilation of vintage stock footage. And about 40 minutes into it, I actually turned off the sound and began doing other things. I was working on an antenna prototype while well, just making notes about the vintage aircraft I saw. So I'm glad the rest of you watched the second half of the movie because I watched it, but I didn't listen to it. I really just wondered what they were going to do with the stock footage. Uh, you know, it's like Ed Wood, said, Ed Wood said, I don't know what's happening, but the Buffalo were very worried. Now it's time to take another round of check-ins. Is there anyone out there who'd like to join us for the Afterglow Movie Net? Uh, it's apparently not a brilliant success, but you might have original observations about it, which could be interesting or important. Or maybe you didn't see it, but you have comments on other Cold War Red Scare movies, black and white or... I'd like to join us tonightically, your name and whether or not you saw Invasion USA from 1952. Check-ins at this time, please. Kilo, Bravo 9, Sarah Oscar Kilo, Sean in Fort Worth. Yes, I did see this movie. Bravo 9, Sierra, Oscar, Kilo, Sean in Fort Worth. I'm going in reverse order tonight. So first, if you can give briefly any observations you had about plot or screenwriting, and then go ahead and kick us off with round two. What did you think of the characters, if you can remember any? Yeah, this is a KB9S, okay. Uh, I actually w wish I had something really interesting to add about this film. Uh, I think it's been pretty well said. This is pretty much 80% uh, stock footage. Uh, some of the airplanes, yes, I agree, or I need to see. But as as you mentioned earlier, and others, and, and that you know, it, it didn't make a lot of sense to see, like you said, one plane take off a different one. You know, these are some of the notes I made as well. Uh, you know, then obviously using the old uh, uh, Norton bomb sites to. Uh, you know, drop atomic bombs, but yet they were showing regular bombs. Uh, and, and I agree that uh, if they were dropping those kind of, and especially that many nukes, there would be absolutely nothing left, or atomic, sorry, atomic bombs, there would be nothing left. Uh, and there's only one brief point that they even mention radiation sickness uh, in the film. But yeah, if that many uh, atomic bombs have been dropped, uh, it would have been much more severe. This movie, I, I, uh, as much as I enjoy the old planes as well, it, it just got kind of old. Uh, and you can tell this was definitely made on the cheap. I agree. I'm sure that's why they went with the storyline of the, Amer you know, dressing like Americans. Um, it's obviously to save money. But I try not to read about these films or anything ahead of time if they're not one of the classics I've already seen. Um, so I kind of, you know, I went in this completely, uh, you know, not knowing anything about it. And when I came to the end of it, uh, I felt that this movie, yeah, it, not knowing what, you know, what I know now from hearing all you talk about it, is I would have thought that actually our government made this film, um, to do propaganda to try to get people willing to back spending money on the military again. You know, obviously after the, you know, the World Wars and, you know, people were starting to, uh, you know, complain about the taxes. Uh, not that that ever goes away, but, <laughs> you know, obviously I, I really thought this was thrown together just as a cheap little film to try to get people to realize that, hey, if we're not prepared to protect ourselves, we're going to regret it, and that's really what this film was about. It was actually a super, super, super simple plot. You know, at the end of the day, you know, hypnotist, basically showing people, you know, uh, you know, what would happen if we didn't, uh, for, you know, spend the money to protect our nation. That was really about it, you know, and it was just about, you know, these, these people trying to, I guess, see their families for our last time, and I, I guess, you know, the love interest is thrown in there like you have to do it in all movies made over the last 50 years in Hollywood. Kind of like you said, uh, you know, something's up when everybody dies, because that's not classic Hollywood. Uh, it's kind of the same way here. you got to have a love story regardless of what the movie's about. Uh, you know, you got to have it in there. Even if the movie was just about groundhogs walking around, <laughs> they would still throw a love interest in there, which is okay in some cases, but, you know, once again, they, you know, it was just... I 
made it through. Uh, I did look at my watch a couple times, hoping this thing ends shortly. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm going to reset here for a second. Yeah, so moving on to the, uh, well, what there was of the, the uh, you know, cast or, you, you know, um, none of them were really very interesting, to be quite honest. Uh, you know, it's very, I, I don't, I hate to say, but I don't think it's even acted particularly all that well. Um, it was just very flat and, you know, I don't know. I just I don't have a whole lot to say about these characters. I don't remember their names, which is not a good sign. Uh, I just know them as the uh, the guy that owned the factory, the hypnotist, and then the the the, uh, the reporter and the love interest, uh, <laughs> and the bartender sons. Uh, about it, uh, just very generic characters. Um, not all that compelling. You know, I guess they were all admitted they make mistakes. I'm not really sure even what the mistake of the uh, the, the reporter wasn't in the love interest other than, I guess they had hoped that they'd met earlier, uh, you know, other than, yeah, being dumb and hiding inside a building during a bombing. Um, <laughs> so, I, you know, uh, I don't know. It, it, it was just, I don't want to say about this many reports. Some of the others that are, got much more insight into this continue. Uh, back to that control, this is KB9S, okay. Well, Sean, thank you very much. Yes, I, I agree with almost everything you said, uh, and I found the characters as frustrating and hard to remember as you did. So I'm hoping we'll hear from somebody else who remembers more or can get a more original insight. N5 IMS JJ pops up on Echolink and says his only comment is that the shots of the president may be to hide the fact that it wasn't an actual president that folks would recognize. Yeah, I, I think Lincoln was not in this movie. Uh, KI5, KWG, Cruz, you're next. And then Brenda and then Tom, if you're still with us, although I know Tom might just need to go to bed. Uh, Cruz, KI5, KWG, uh, go ahead. Characters, did you remember who they were? KI5, KWG, yeah, I don't remember their names either. And uh, I agree, that's not a good sign. And uh, so, oh, and before I forget, I'd like to thank uh, Tony, Tom, Brenda, and all the other Georges who do the net control so the rest of us can enjoy it. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see what I had here. Uh, simplistic characters, um, both in, in characterizations, too, both in the plot and the characters. Uh, but I thought the actors did a fairly good job of rescuing themselves from becoming what we would now call memes. Um, I, so I thought that the acting was adequate. Um, nobody stunk. Um, well, okay, the, 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 the extras who were playing the Russian soldiers, I thought they were pretty loud. Um, but I thought the main characterizations, uh, characters uh, were, were fairly well acted. Um, I did note that uh, once again, we have uh, the beautiful woman in a world of men who's sexually aggressive towards all the men, and, or at least one of them, uh, just like we had last week, as a matter of fact. I thought, oh, this is really a 1950s theme, isn't it? Um, I've forgotten, who was it that mentioned uh, the um, having trouble with those, it, 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 it's hard to say that word for me, it, enigmatic uh, characters? And uh, I was thinking, he's right, but I actually kind of like him. I read these, this is going to be really obscure comment, but Prester John, at least I think it's obscure, um, character in medieval, um, and maybe even pre-medieval um, literature, where you've got this omniscient, mystical character running around. And uh, I've always enjoyed that concept because I think it's always the author inserting him himself, since he knows the story, um, into the story. I think that's kind of a fun thing to, to look at. Don't think I have any other comments on the uh, on the acting, and uh, so I'll hold off and only have one comment on the uh, special effects, etc. at the end. So this is KI5, KWG, back to Matt. Okay, very good. Thank you. I've got an asterisk for you in the round three column. 
Uh, and yet, George, I, I have read very old stories in which George was used, was used as a generic name. Like there's always a George in every unit in the army. And, and George is the morale officer and has to take attendance at meetings and get stuck with all these odd jobs. And I just, I haven't read a story or something with a George in it that was written after about 1945. So yeah, that's, that's an old reference. But, but we Georges are, uh, are happy to help make the Nets go. Uh, so, so thank you for that, and I'll, I'll put you down for the next round. And uh, yeah, that, that one trope of that, the, the woman who's very selectively available to somebody, but has to go for, for somebody. She can't finish the movie without a man. Uh, yes, it's the 50s. Uh, and speaking of people who object to tropes in the 50s, uh, next up is Brenda, WB5OZL, then Tom, KE5ICX, and then Brandon, KI5SX. You are so right about me. This is WB5OZL. Um, yeah, and remembering the 50s and being a woman, I always rankled, uh, was, was rankled by the stereotypes of the silly woman, and uh, it, uh, just, it, it irritated me then, it irritates me now, but that was a part of life. You know, you wonder what if the only woman in the bar had been older, or maybe unattractive, or pregnant, or... Uh, you know, somehow unavailable to all the men in there, or all the men in the audience. And but she's always a beautiful woman. <clears throat> and uh, and the the ratio seems to be one woman and all the men. If there were two women, uh, particularly of equal attractiveness, it would have totally change the dynamic of the whole plot. Uh, characters were. Um, Sort of stereotypical, I think, or cliched. Uh, to me, there wasn't a real standout of interesting characters. You weren't really sure who the main character or protagonist was. Uh, I was a little concerned about the newscaster who, every time he got a, a break, he had to pop out for a drink. And the people at work didn't notice he was coming back smelling like alcohol. I just thought that was a little strange. But the movie, you know, the plot really didn't give the characters much of anything interesting to do, not in my opinion. And I didn't think any of them were terribly interesting in, on their own. And the actors were vaguely familiar, I'm sure. There was the event. Uh, they, they couldn't carry the movie at all. Um, a lot of movies, you have strong characters, and you kind of don't care what else is going on. They're just so much fun to watch. But not so with these people. They were very blah. Okay, back to net, WB5OZL. It's kind of the opposite, in a way, of Alien, which is a movie I love. They're, they're very careful to only have one attractive woman in it, at least only one woman who's presented that way, but at least I can remember all the characters and their names. Uh, yeah, I, I need to go watch a good movie tomorrow. Uh, so, so thank you for your comments. I appreciate that. Yeah, the characters were very much not the main event. I like that phrase. Uh, KE5ICX, then Brandon, KI5SXE, and then J, KG5BZW, and then N5BB will be last on this round. Uh, Tom, KE5ICX, can you remember any of the characters? Oh no, they're quite forgettable. But I do have alternate characters from an alternate reality. Both of these people were from Detroit, Michigan, and appeared in two movies that we have seen. Well, one of them was in a movie. But yeah, I, I, first, I would want to mention that, you know, uh, the, the newscaster who would pop into the bar and drink and then go back to the new newscast. In Detroit, we had one of those. Actually, we had two of those. First one was Bill Bonds. Bill Bonds was a guy on, on WXYZ TV. He was uh, the, the newscaster there. He was the anchor. And you have seen him. 
you have all seen him, even though he was from Detroit. He is the, or was, the confused um, television guy in Escape from the Planet of the Apes when they explained the looping time thing. And he, uh, he interviews uh, Cornelius and Zira, I think it was, the two of them. And uh, he used to, he was a real news guy uh, in Detroit, and he would run over to the corner bar and come back. And it was always fun to watch him on TV because, quite honestly, uh, he sometimes looked like he was in the bag. Uh, a few times you would see he had a cigarette and an ashtray underneath the counter, uh, and you could see the smoke coming up from the side. So he used to do all these. And I remember quite distinctly when I was in sixth grade, uh, one of my uh, uh, co-playmates, I guess, in sixth grade had, had told me one time, Tom, that, you know what happened last night? We had a car that, that went into the ditch out in front of our house, and and they opened the door, and inside was Bill Bonds. He got out of the car, and they took him away. Uh, he was very well known. And then, and then, of course, there is Let Me Reset. A fellow by the name of Bill Kennedy. Now, you may or may not know Bill personally. He appeared in uh, some of the uh, Lone Ranger movies and or television shows, and he also was uh, Detroit for America's favorite movie host. But uh, Bill was also the voice of Faster Than a Speeding Bullet, um, more powerful than a locomotive. That was his voice, and he, he would always... Before he did, uh, there was a bar across the street. He would go and get tanked up and then go over and do a show. The reason I know this is, is that one of the people I worked with uh, actually uh, uh, saw Bill all the time because he worked at the same studio. He eventually became my boss. He was in television for a short time, local television, and then became my boss at uh, Mother X many, many years ago. So that's how I know about that story. So there you have it, uh, two drunks, no waiting, uh, both in television, and uh, yeah, they used to drink a lot, and smoke too, don't forget smoking. Now, about our characters, uh, nobody I particularly cared about, although, as I mentioned, Gerald Moore, I, I really liked as the devil in uh, Visit to Hades in Lost in Space, one of my favorite episodes, by the way, if you're into that sort of thing. He was pretty much boring and actually nondescript, I didn't even recognize him. But he died at uh, 54, I think, because of a heart attack when he was heading to Sweden to do some TV thing. They buried him there. Apparently he didn't have any family and nobody wanted him back. Carla was uh, Carla. Uh, I used to work in a factory. And she, she's in this dress and it looks like she's never seen the inside of a factory in her life. Uh, probably not even the inside of a kitchen anywhere either. So I don't think she did any manual labor at any time in her life. Uh, so nothing there. Uh, I saw William Schallard there. What did he, which one was he? In this? Uh, he? He played the second broadcaster after the other guy got shot. Uh, you'll recognize, recognize him from Star Trek as Niall Barris from The Trouble with Tribble, the uh, guy who headed up the space station K-9. So yeah, he was in a very young version of him. No, there wasn't anybody very interesting. I the radio just bad ad was senior, huh? Uh, who knows? Okay, I don't have anything else to say because I found the actors rather boring. Uh, back to net control, KE5 IC. Very good, Tom. Thank you. And JJ over on Echolink is also mentioning uh, local TV reporters uh, hanging out at the free bar at political events they were supposed to be covering. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> the cigarette smoke sneaking up from behind the counter, uh, the, the news anchor desk would have been pretty amusing. It would have been more okay in bygone years, but pretty amusing to me. Uh, KI5SXC, Brandon over in Wiley, do you have any comments about the characters? Um, I'll just briefly add that I think that everyone um, is 
forgettable to everyone because uh, they're so predictable. Um, they're they're pretty much cookie cutter uh, for the uh, the title being uh, what it was. So I think um, you know that's that's pretty much about it. Is they're they're pretty predictable. Uh, no surprises. Um, yeah, straightforward. Kilo India Five Sierra X Ray Echo back to my control. Brandon, I'll pause there and say that that's my comment as well. Uh, I have no end of round comments to give, except I forgot them all. They were forgettable. Uh, they just came from a stock footage factory. Uh, KG5BZWJ in Weatherford, do you have any character comments? Uh, this is KG5BZW. Uh, I, I know the boy the uh the Russians uh the supposed Russians um uh, which uh <laughs> um yeah that those I mean at, at least the stock characters were you know they cannot fit the, those characters the the the, the Russian uh, characters were I don't know what they were um I just can't they, they, that that I uh, it's uh, like the same um, fake uh, Eastern European accent, and but I wouldn't even call, call it a fake Eastern European accent. They barely uh, uh, attempted anything like of the sort. Uh, there was like this one guy that was uh, that I don't know if he was acting as a. Uh, a, a um, uh, he, the guy that was uh, at the the factory just before the soldiers came in, I mean, I mean, he was the only one that actually had a convincing foreign accent. I wouldn't say it was. Uh, it might, well, yeah, no, it it, it sounded. You know, I don't know if I want to make a guess as to what the 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 accent was actually, but it. I don't think it was anywhere near Russian. Um, but it was a definite foreign accent. Uh, it kind of sounds Eastern European. Ian. Uh, but, uh, I, yeah, that, I, at least, that's, I guess that's my two cents is like, at least the stock characters did fit their, the stock characters. The, those others are just, you know, they're all over the place. KG5 ECW. Okay, very good. And, and actually, I have to kind of maybe disagree with you. I did not like the accent at all, whatever it was supposed to be. You know, I've heard so many accents over the years, and a lot of them are, are actually rather pretty. It's, it's kind of neat to hear the great diversity of accents in English and how it brings people together. Uh, you're, oh, you're from Marseille, you're from Lagos, you're from Warsaw, uh, you're from Paris, where, wherever. Uh, you're from Buenos Aires. And, and we're all trying to learn the same language, and, and I just love hearing all the accents real people have. Uh, it makes me curious to know more about them in real life. Not this movie. I've I met a fair number of Eastern European people and Russians, and they, they don't sound like that. Uh, I, I found that rather, rather painful. Uh, uh, did not like. Uh, N5BB, uh, you're up last for round two. Uh, Bill, go ahead, please. Thank you, Tony. This is N5BB. I agree with you, Tony. The accent, <clears throat> the accent of the he enemy, that's why they were called he. The accent of the he was annoy, annoying, annoying accent. Yes, sir. I uh, didn't understand it. It didn't make any sense. Well, I've got some things about the characters. The uh, male protagonist, um, Vince Potter, was played by Gerald Moore. And I've seen him in other things before. He's got this very movie actor kind of face. 
And the the, uh, his, the love interest, was, uh, the character Carla Sanford, was played by Peggy Castle. Peggy Castle was rather tall for a woman. She was 5'7 in green eyes. Uh, the Southern California Restaurant Association named her Miss Cheesecake for 1949. And the Junior Chamber of Commerce named her Miss Three Alarm. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, but she was in a number of things. By the way, she, she died of cirrhosis of the liver. Um, most of the, the actors in this movie died young of heart disease or you know, lung cancer or liver disease or something. Because somebody else mentioned... They're smoking and drinking all the time, just like all the other movies and TV shows of the late 40s and the 50s. So um, uh, more things about the protagonist. Um, there, this is some, this is some uh, dialogue. I've got to read this. this is, I, I don't know if the, if the writer had his tongue in his cheek and this is purposely kind of stilted funny or whether – out this way, whether it was straight, I don't know. So the um, so Carla, the blood interest, she says in the bar when when the fighting is starting, you know, when the when the airplane the TV is showing all the airplanes coming and everything. She says it's a nightmare. This can't be happening. Of course, we now know it was a nightmare, but anyway, a, a real nightmare. It was a dream sequence. Anyway. It's a nightmare. This can't be happening. Vince says, it was a cinch to happen. Last time... They... Rather strange uh, dialogue. And uh, Mr. Oman, you know, the, uh, the odd guy, the hypnotist there on the end of the bar, says... I think America wants new leadership. And Vince Potter asked him, what kind of leadership do you suggest? I suggest a wizard. What? A wizard like Merlin who could kill his enemies by wishing them dead. That's the way we like to be communism now, by wishing it dead. that weird dialogue? It's just a wizard, the leader. Um, did you notice in the bar there was some character there that I don't know if he was credited, but in the industrialist office, right before the troops come in, this guy's in his office arguing with the industrialist about whether they're going to make tanks. And then the troops come in. And then we see that this guy that's doing the arguing actually is one of the invading troops, the he. And then he directs, I think, the, uh, the guys with guns to shoot Vince Potter. And then this guy I'm talking about, the bad guy, we see him talking with the other uh, generals or something. I don't know if he was credited. I couldn't find him in the credits, but he's, he was a truly evil guy there. Uh, in the movie. Um, a little more dialogue before I finish. This was the second airline ticket agent. And this is very comical. The dry way. Woman, could I get a ticket to Gardner Field, Montana? Agent, Gardner Field, Montana? That's right. Agent, is this a business trip? I'm sorry, I'm falling down laughing. Is this a business trip? This is when the war is going on. Woman, no, I want to go home. My husband's there. My children are with him. Ticket agent, I'm sorry, madam. All flights to Gardner Field have been discontinued. Woman, discontinued? For how long? Ticket agent, I'm afraid, permanently. Woman, there hasn't 
been an attack agent early this morning. Was it serious? And the uh, the line that tops it off, ticket agent, in a bomb. <laughs> I'm sorry, that breaks me up. Inside BB, that's all I got. Well, it is serious, and stop calling me Shirley. Uh, well, yeah, I wonder if if they would have said there wasn't an A bomb if it was a business trip. Uh, it's just yeah. It's oddly constructed dialogue in a way no one would actually do. Ah, Miss Cheesecake. Well, well, thank you for all that. Uh, obviously, uh, as I said, I forgot them all. I muted the sound. I just looked for stock footage of uh, old airplanes. I can't remember any of the characters. I have nothing to say about them. Uh, it's getting late. It is, it's gotten late. It is late already. And I'm NT5TM for the DFW Metroplex Afterglow movie discussion net. Uh, but we don't pass traffic, but we do try to chase these bad movies away and make them hang their heads in shame. Uh, unless they're good, in which case we praise them and give them awards. If you'd like to join us, if you'd like to join us, if you're brave enough to share what you think about this movie, or any movie really, please come now with your call signed phonetically, your name, and let us know if you saw Invasion USA from 1952. That's purely optional. Your life will probably be better if you didn't see it. Come now with your call sign phonetically. Okay, now commenting in this third round is optional. Uh, I'll call on people. If you don't have anything to say, that's okay. This is the catch-all, music, special effects, editing, uh, other things, uh, perhaps archival research, uh, what, what kind of jet fighter to show him, which kind of aircraft carrier. Uh, I have nothing positive to add this round. I'll, I'll lead off with that. Uh, I know it's not control's privilege to go last, but that doesn't matter. Uh, I thought their use of stock footage was remarkably poor and incoherent. I think Ed Wood would have done better. Uh, and that was really their only effect. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> oh my goodness, JJ just popped up on Echo Link and said, try this. If you don't check in now, we'll make you have to watch this film. <laughs> oh, oh, so good. Uh, so, so JJ, I'll watch chat in case you have a comment for round three here. Uh, but, uh, Sean, can Comment. If so, go ahead. Yeah, this is KB9. That's okay. Uh, really, too much of it. Then, yeah, as you already said, there's not really any special effects in this film due to the fact that it was just all stock footage. So, uh, okay. So, yeah, and, and I guess maybe the only uh, uh, special effect, is, as Tom mentioned, is they had that really nice uh, futuristic flat screen television in the bar. So, there you go. Back to that. This is KB9. That's okay. But hey, at least it was an admiral, a big prestigious band brand even today. Ha ha ha. Cruise, KI5, KWG, you're up, then WB5, LKE5, ICX, and Brandon, KI5, SXE. Uh, Cruise, you said you did have something for round three. Oh, please, I hope it's better than what I had to say. Go ahead. KI5, KWG, actually, it's not. Uh, as good, but I did. I did want to make one note that I because it is a positive, and I I thought it was interesting and it caught my attention, and that was the double exposures usually with that stock footage um, being used as a backdrop. For 1952, I thought they looked pretty good, and uh, really didn't seem to be any scenes in it or um, that I've even seen in late of the 80s, maybe even 90s. I thought that was uh, fairly impressive, but working with stock footage seems to be a good theme. I, I imagine they had time uh, uh, to put in there. That. that was the only comment I had. I was wondering if anybody else noticed it. But that's it. I'm done. I've enjoyed this one again. KI5, KWG, back to you next.
appreciate your finding. Uh, I also really liked your, your earlier comment about how incongruous it was that the tractor manufacturer was the only guy in the world who doesn't know that defense contracts are lucrative. <sighs> oh, well, if only he'd known. We could have had more tanks. Uh, wb 5 ozl Brenda, it's you, then Tom, then Brandon, then Jay. Uh, Brenda, do you have anything for round three? Well, I suspect Brenda has gone to sleep. That's okay. It's that kind of movie. Maybe Tom's gone to sleep, too, and I won't blame him. It is that kind of movie. Tom, do you have anything for the catch-all round? Well, let's see. The only thing I can say about it is, boy, that was a big brandy sister. That was really something. It was gigantic. I don't think I've ever seen one that big. You could, like, put... Uh, you know, living room furniture in that thing. It was so huge, and everybody stared at it. And then that whole hypnotizing thing, I don't know how that works. Group hypnotism? Oh, well, it was fine. The only other thing I have to say is that taxi driver, boy, he was loyal to the end. That guy drove all over Hell's Half Acre, taking those two guys. I don't think he ever got paid. Well, he didn't get paid because they, they ended up going out to sea. Hmm. Not sure. Well, that's it for me. What a wonderful movie. I'll let you know what the, the next one is whenever you're ready. KE5 ICX. Well, Tom, hopefully that will be soon. Uh, Brandon, KI5 SXE. Now, this is optional, but if you do have a comment about effects or music or any of the other stuff, you're welcome to make it now. Uh, the only thing I have is uh, I like the ending in terms of the twist. Uh, it brought it together for me. Otherwise, I would have hated the movie. Um, that's all I have, and I'm looking forward to hearing what the next one is. Kilo Indy 5, Sierra X-Ray Echo, back to net. Well, a good twist always makes the cocktail a little better. Uh, KG5, BZWJ, any comments for round three? This is KG5BZW. I, I, at first, I thought there was, I didn't really have any comments because what special effects were there? Well, actually, there were. Um, uh, the, the first one that's actually, uh, I almost hate to, uh, I'm extending this way too long. Of course, there's the, the woman falling to her death, the, the spinny, uh, the, the gal was literally probably just, Screaming, but while laying down on something with a camera, just kind of turn her. Uh, it, I don't know if it was a, it was a video. I mean, uh, not video, film footage of her screaming while it was going. While they spun adult, uh, the the film to do the drop, whatever. And there was that. Uh, and the second thing was, uh, which was really kind of odd because. And on top of being really confusing because they mention they they show the conventional bombs, uh, World War II bombs. While also, uh, on some in some cases they they it seemed to imply that they were actually they they actually sworn they said that uh, New York had a, a nuclear bomb, but it was like. <laughs> uh, I, I wish I had written down the actual quote of what uh, was said. It was like there's this implication that the the, har the hardy uh, American uh, construction contained the explosions and all that. And um, I think they they literally said it was an atomic explosion and whatnot. It's like I I you know I. I know there are some, there have been some hardy buildings that, uh, built. Um, I don't know. I, I really don't think uh, it would quite work at uh, what they showed. And, and of course, they during the bombing, they had the one 
building which uh, partially collapsed, uh, which uh, apparently had a lot of concrete and stuff, which I, uh, I mean, sure, if it's mostly concrete like that, but of course we've had, you know, we know uh, from history uh, how certain things uh, fall down. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but other than that, there there really isn't much to to say. Um, <laughs> it was, I'm still chuckling at that that weird comment. Uh, anyway, uh, into five p.m. The schedule five busy up. BZW. Back to that. Well, thank you, Jay, for those uh, final thoughts. And also uh, up here for final thoughts before Tom announces the next movie is N5BB. Uh, Bill, if you're there, do you have anything for round three? Yes, this is N5BB. I agree with Tom. The taxi driver was amazing. I, I don't know if he was credited, but he was amazing. He just he just drove everywhere. And, you know, this movie was, oh, man, so many people died. I mean, the taxi gets washed off. And did you notice they're going to Boulder City? Boulder City is up, it's up in elevation. It's up on the top. It's not down below Hoover Dam. They got their geography wrong. Um, some other things. Uh, Tom, yes, that was Edward G. Robinson, Jr., one of the sons of Edward G. Robinson. And um, he was a ne'er-do-well. He wrote bad checks and died early and drank too much and you name it. Um, the flat-screen TV. Uh, I read somewhere that uh, they were experimenting uh, early on with Fresnel lenses because they couldn't make big TV tubes. So what they had was uh, sometimes a mirror from a, they had a rather small TV to and maybe a mirror, uh, and then you, they used a Fresnel lens to make it large. So that's what I saw somewhere. Is that's what it? That's what that TV was. Was the use of the Fresnel lens to make that like that? So I got good night. Five BB. Well, thank you very much, Bill. And, uh, yeah, you know, I hadn't thought about that odd arrangement with the TV with the lens. So that's kind of neat. Maybe there was some hidden technology. This is NT5TM. For looking at me and telling me to run in the dog or wondering where I am. So it's time to wrap it up. Uh, first, I'll take a final round of check-ins. Uh, this is the last call for check-ins. Come now with your call sign phonetically, and I'll put you on the list. Final call. And then our last piece of official business is Tom, KE5ICX. Tell us, with what brilliant masterpiece can we illuminate our lives in this next week? Well, Tony, I'm so glad you asked me that question because next week's movie is... Here it is. Da -da -da. Teenage Cavemen from 1958. Starring Robert Vaughn as the unnamed symbol maker's son. He'll be fantastic. I will send out the updates and links. Of course, it's YouTube. And uh, be, be right there. And I will send out the email. Uh, so if you're not on the media email and you want to, send me an email at KE5ICX, Echo 5 India Charlie X-Ray at Yahoo.com. Or go to the Facebook page, which is Afterglow Movie. That's two words, Afterglow and Movie, and sign up there, and you can see it. The guide shows all future movies. If you're on the on the uh, Facebook page, just look at it. It will show you the easiest way to do them right now because they've changed YouTube yet again. That's it for me. Have a good evening. This is KE5 Ice. Teenage Caveman. I guess better than Teenage Wasteland, unless he's a caveman in the wasteland. Good night, everybody. This is NT5TM. Uh, this
not to sleep long here. Oh no, T.S. Eliot. 